Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to the Moonshot International Symposium Day 2, the Working Group 7 on Cross-Sectional Issue. This is the second part of the day and the topic will be Mathematical Science as Cross-Sectional for MS Goals. Thank you all for joining us. Now, let's get started. To begin this afternoon's agenda, it is my pleasure to introduce the chairs of this working group, Dr. Kotani Motoko, Professor of Mathematics Institute, Graduate School of Science, Tohoku University. First, let's invite Professor Emmanuel Candice, the Burnham Simon Chair in Mathematics and Statistics, of Stanford University to give a talk on mathematics in the real world, some recent successes and open challenges. Professor Candice will join from California via Skype. Please look at the screen ahead. Professor Candice will deliver the presentation. Hi, um, I would like to greet everyone. I'm very pleased to participate to this Moonshot Conference I regret that my schedule does not allow me to be physically in Tokyo, but only remotely today. And so uh, my understanding is that uh, I'm tasked to tell you about the importance of mathematics, especially as it relates to other disciplines. And so today my talk will uh, cover several areas and will also present past successes of mathematics as it relates to other disciplines, but also uh, challenges that I consider to be extremely important, uh, showing you that much of the work uh, needs to be uh, done. So um, uh, briefly, uh, this is how medical diagnostic looked like a few centuries ago. And if there was something wrong with your body, uh, really there were no option except than opening you up to see uh, whether you had a fracture or lesion or tumor or anything of this sort. And fortunately, over uh, the last decades, uh, medical diagnostic has, has progressed tremendously. And so now we have, of course, ways of probing uh, the interior of your body in a far less invasive way. One uh, imaging modality, uh, which is ex becoming extremely important and has been extremely important for a while, is called magnetic resonance imaging. And so because of time, I will not be able to tell you about the physics of magnetic resonance imaging. Suffice us to say that it's a technique, a modality that uses very uh, subtle quantum properties of matter, the fact that protons have a spin, to produce images um, in an indirect way of, your, uh, of the tissues inside your, your body. And so what we can say mathematically is that, uh, skipping a lot of details, is that when you enter a scan, uh, the scan will measure things about you in an indirect fashion, and what it measures really are the Fourier coefficients of, and of, uh, of the image we wish to produce. And so we see a first uh, connection with mathematics, which is that it produces an object we're familiar with, which is the spectrum of the image we care about. And so when you enter a scan, um, well, you, it, well, the scan will collect the data on the right, and if you want to make up a picture, then you will invert the Fourier transform to make the photograph that you see on the left. And so, as you know, we use this modality uh, pretty much every day now. Now, one thing that uh, we do with this is uh, we image uh, patients all the time, and you have two figures here on the left of abdominal blood vessels and on the right of the knee junction. Now, one thing that uh, we discuss a bit less, although I'm sure that some of you may have experience with this, is that it takes a long time to acquire a, a scan. So this requires patients to stay a long time in a scanner. And it's because, you know, again, because of this physics, which we, we have to wait until uh, spins relax to equilibria. And so which means that per unit time, we can collect a certain number of data points. And so the collection, the data collection, the scan time is long, the collection is slow. And so it looks a bit like this, you know, this is tick, tick, I collect a second data point, a third data point, and you know, you know, after the, uh, some time elapses, you know, I have a complete scan and I done, and I can invert the, the Fourier transform and get my image. 
Now, the fact that it takes a long time, poses a lot of challenges, well, it reduces the workflow uh, through these expensive machines. It means that perhaps we cannot acquire videos of the quality we would like to have them. It's difficult to produce 3D images. One thing that I was very sensitive to is the fact that uh, magnetic resonance imaging is rarely used on children for a very simple reason is that children cannot stay still for very long and therefore uh, the scan will be blurred. Now, uh, right away uh, in this talk, I want to introduce, um, to present a real story which has to do with a boy who had received uh, at Stanford University a donor's liver to replace his own failing organ and his medical tests were alarming and you know he was perhaps uh, his life was greatly endangered and there was a chance that the bile ducts were blocked. Now to tell you the problem with long scan times is that well if we need to see whether the bile um, ducts were blocked we need a, a full resolution scan which takes about two minutes of a child time in which dur during, during which the child cannot take even a single breath. And so what doctors used to do, which is extremely risky, is to stop respiration for two minutes. That is, you deprive the, ox the, the brain from oxygen for two minutes, the child does not breathe even once during these two minutes, you get a full resolution scan, and then, uh, and then you see what's wrong. But you can see that it's extremely risky, and that's why we don't use it very much. And so, honestly, after uh, depriving your brain uh, for two minutes of oxygen, the liver may actually be the least of your worries. Okay, so this is why uh, this is of little use in pediatrics, and so we, we, we don't use it that much. Now, we, everybody in the medical field would like to, spin up, uh, to speed up acquisition times, but because it takes a certain amount of time to actually gather data, what it means is that we're going to have to get going with fewer samples, fewer data points. And mathematically, what this means, it means that we're going to have to invert a system which is underdetermined. That is, we have going to have far fewer rows than unknowns, far fewer equations than unknowns. And we know from basic mathematics that we cannot solve for x if I have too few equations. Now, in 2004, we were approached by a team of radiologists really concerned by the long scan times, and they provided uh, template images. And so what they had done is they would take uh, an image at, like the one you see on the left, uh, basically would mimic a, a, data, a full data collection, but say, we know, we do not have time for this data collection. We're going to only see samples, and I hope the picture shows correctly in Tokyo, along these radial lines that you're gonna, you see going through the origin. And <clears throat> then we try to invert something that we cannot possibly invert, and they would get med images that are completely unsuitable for uh, medical diagnostics. And uh, in an experiment I did with Justin Romberg and Terence Tao, we proposed a different reconstruction algorithm that does something very simple. And to our greatest surprise, uh, this algorithm actually reconstructed the image that the doctors had submitted to us with no error whatsoever, even though 98% of the equations were missing. And the algorithm was a bit agnostic about the kind of images that was given to us. It just minimized, it solved an optimization problem where it tried to find an object whose uh, total variation, uh, for those of you who know what that is, is, is minimum. That is, among all candidate solutions, pick the one with minimum total variation. And so I think mathematically the problem we're looking at looks something like this. Uh, this is mimicking a bit the scan collection. We have data on the left, which is Y. We have the measurement that the scan takes, which is the rows of the matrix A you see, and you have the object you care about. And then a crucial concept here is the concept of sparsity. What if the solution you're looking for is, has a few non-zero entries, you don't know where they are, but mostly has zeros. Can I invert a system like this if I know that the right-hand side, the solution I'm looking for, is sparse in the sense that it has a few non-zero entries, but most of its entries are actually uh, zero. And so, well, so suppose this is your premise. What are you going to do? Well, one thing you could do is to try to find among all possible solutions 
the solution with that minimizes a norm, and here we're going to use the L1 norm, and the L1 norm is the easiest uh, norm you can think of, uh, which is just minimize the sum of the magnitude of the signal you're looking for. And so the proposal is to minimize this L1 norm subject to data collection. And for those of you who care about these things, this is something we can do extremely rapidly on the computer. Uh, it's actually a linear program in, in disguise. And the mathematical uh, surprise is something like this. That is, if you give me a right-hand side, if I'm trying to invert a system where the right-hand side is sparse, I have too few equations. Gauss says I should not be able to solve this system, but I'm going to try to recover it by minimum L1 solution. Then the mathematical theorem, which is a surprise, which kind of shocked a lot of people at the time, was, well, if the right-hand side happens to be sparse, and if the rows of A are not sparse, uh, they are dense and diverse, that they are not all the same and to some extent, then the solution to this linear program uh, will actually recover the truth exactly. And so when does it recover the truth exactly? It recovers the truth if the number of equations, the number of samples you give me is a small multiple of the number of non-zero coefficient. And what it says, it says that you can dramatically undersample data acquisition if you have sparsity, there is no information loss. And so, in a way, this explains this curious phenomenon that we saw before. You'd say, well, this image is not sparse because a sparse image is an image which would be mostly black with a few white pixels. Yes, it's true, this image is not sparse, but its gradient is sparse. And so, uh, we have sparsities in the, not perhaps the image domain, but it's in, in the derivative of this image is sparse. And so the theorem adapts to these cir circumstances and it explains why the recovery is exact, because it can recover exactly from dramatically undersampled data uh, images with sparse gradients. All right, so, so this was a, a bit of a discovery at the time. And so uh, uh, we went back to these uh, medical doctors and they were very quick to implement these ideas. And so this has been extremely successful and now I'm going to show you a work that is not mine, and it's done by a team of radiologists who took these ideas and put them to work in, in real scans on real patients. And so what you see here on the right is um, a scan of a six-year-old boy uh, that has been accelerated eight times. So instead of a two-minute scan, as I mentioned before, uh, you're now looking at a 16-second scan. And what you can see, and I don't know if you see well on this image, you see an image of, uh, with really infinite uh, details that are perfectly suitable for medical diagnostics. Now, I want to go back to my story, which is a true story, the one of this two-year-old boy who had alarming scans and alarming tests, sorry. So instead of uh, putting the boy through a two-minute scan, uh, they put it through a 15-second scan according to this technique. They used L1 to reconstruct this image. The doctor saw that two bile ducts were blocked. They performed surgery, and uh, today, and that happened 10 years ago or eight years ago, and today this boy is, is alive and well. So uh, this has been uh, taken a bit, the, the MR community by storm. Um, on the left, you see the kind of images that people could produce with conventional scans and parallel imaging. On the right, you looking at what now are called this compressed sensing reconstruction. And what's remarkable about these images is that what the image you see on the right takes eight times less to acquire than the image on the left. And still you see uh, lesions that are barely seen on conventional scans that are eight times slower that you can see, and this is where my arrows are, are quite visible on the reconstruction uh, that offered by, by these new techniques. Okay, this is another photograph, uh, another scan uh, of the portal vein or in the liver of a six-year-old male. And, you know, it's very hard to distinguish the portal vein on the traditional scan, but on the right, you can see clearly the ducts, the veins, the hepatic vein, and that's what people are looking at, radiologists, experts, not like me, to see whether something is, is wrong with a child. So there's been a lot of work uh, in the um, 
in the medical imaging community about really implementing these ideas and, and making them work. Um, I should say, and maybe I'll skip ahead, uh, I'm sorry to skip ahead, I'll come back to say that after quite a while, uh, these techniques have been approved by the Food and Drug Administrations, and so if you look at all modern scans uh, released by Siemens, uh, GE, um, Philips, and so on, they all have implemented these techniques to speed up uh, acquisition times. Okay, so not only this, but now we can also uh, use these techniques to actually um, produce movies of, of, for example, here of the liver of a, of a, of a child uh, that has been accelerated 13 times. Um, and you can look at it frame by frame and uh, you can see that the picture on the right, which is a uh, joint work with two radiologists that I've done a few years ago, uh, shows that uh, you can get um, very accurate reconstructions and detect lesions that are not really visible on conventional scans. Uh, this is the same thing for kidneys, uh, but I just want the point of this slide is to show you that uh, you can move from 2D to 3D and then from 3D plus time, like essentially videos. Okay, um, you know, people are making fancy movies and image things that were not possible before uh, using these techniques. And so it has really, uh, it's a way in which mathematics has really changed uh, the way we, we approach uh, medical diagnostics. All right. Um, now I spend about 15 minutes on, on, on successes. I just want to spend 10 minutes on uh, opportunities and challenges uh, in the data-driven era. So we're going to switch field and talk about problems I consider to be important. I'll try to talk about two things that I see coming that are important. And then uh, maybe in the last five minutes, I can enter entertain a few questions. So one thing which is taking the world by storm is that uh, we used to rely on mechanistic models to make predictions, and as you know, the development of mathematics has gone hand in hand with the development of physics to the point that we have actually derived equations that make astoundingly precise predictions about the future of physical systems. And here, for example, I, 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 I highlighted three giants that everybody knows about. Now, perhaps what is a bit less well known is that oh, about a century ago, we started to learn how to make predictions not using mechanistic models, not using first principles, but from data only. And here I refer to the two of the founding fathers of the field of statistics, uh, Francis Galton and Ronald Fisher, one trying to introduce the concept of prediction of quantitative outcomes, the other about the prediction of uh, categorical outcomes from um, features. And I think I don't need to tell you that uh, today machine learning and non-mechanistic algorithms are all the rage. Uh, you know, random forest gradient boostings or neural nets are used thousands if not millions of times a day. Uh, neural networks uh, were awarded the Turing Award this year in computer science. And, you know, it's all the rage at the moment. So. I think it is fair to say that there's a bit of a tension at the moment between, you know, these models are extremely complex. They're, by all means, they are black boxes, and so they lack interpretability, and that's a problem for many scientists. I think that with time, people will become comfortable with model complexity because, in some cases, this model can really predict well, and so we're just going to have to use it then. But there are two things that are agitating the world at the moment. The first is the fact that there are two things we can't surrender. And the, the no, first thing is reflectability. That is, the conclusions I draw today need to hold up tomorrow. You know, science is the thing that needs to replicate itself. But as I argue in a minute, uh, science seems to replicate less and less, and that's a major concern. The second is, of course, the reliability of these big, complex machine learning algorithms that we deploy. Are my predictions valid, especially when we're talking about applications that are more and more sensitive, that impact people's lives directly? 
And how do I communicate the uncertainty that I have about the quality of the prediction I produce? And these two things we can't possibly surrender. So the first issue is an enormous topic of discussion in the United States and in, in the UK. Um, the fact is that uh, science replicates less and less. And uh, you see at the bottom this cover of The Economist about a few years ago, how science goes wrong. Uh, you know, every week there's articles in the New York Times about the fact that science is mirrored in a replicability crisis and it's not going to be easy to fix. Just to give you a sense, uh, a lot of this discussion started with a paper published in Nature that had tremendous impact by Bigley and Ellis. And I'll just give you a fact. And the fact is that Amgen took six out of 53 studies that they considered to be absolutely landmark in basic cancer science, and they set out to reproduce them. And the problem is that they could reproduce only six out of these 53 studies. In 47 cases, the effects that were reported in prestigious journals such as Nature, Science, The Lancet, and so on, had vanished into the air. Healthcare Bayer, which is a German equivalent, did something similar. They took what they considered to be 67 seminal studies, tried to replicate them, and could replicate less than a quarter. So we have a real problem, and one of the problems we have is that you know the way we do science has completely changed. The way we used to do science, you know. Uh, from an epistemological point of view, you know, scientists would formulate hypotheses, and then they would actually try to um, test these hypotheses. These theories would make predictions, and then they would test these predictions against carefully collected data. Today, things have been inverted. We collect data first, and then we build scientific theories. We test hypotheses. And this is a real big problem in, in, in the way we practice science today, there's nothing wrong with this, but what it means is we need new mathematical tools, new statistical tools to address the way in which we conduct science today. So what is science is about? Science is about, well, you know, I can look everywhere, I can measure a lot of things at once, and so, but I wanna know, you know, what, for example, what mutations drive a particular phenotype? Why mutation drive uh, whether or not I'm going to get a type of cancer. And so we can type, we can measure lots of mutations in the genome, and then we can use statistical tools to actually measure the importance of mutations. And so on, on the plot, you see a screen where I'm trying to assay 500 of the covariates that I think influence a response, and there are many of them. And if I were to get a, a similar, uh, exactly another sample of, of patients, the, the biology is the same, but then I get very different answers all of a sudden because there's tremendous variability from one sample to the next. Now, the question we're looking at is I have only one sample and I can try to measure the importance of my mutations. And, you know, I can see that, you know, some, these two values that I've circled are kind of large. Should I report them and write my nature paper? Or should I apply what you might want to think about a second level of, of higher criticism? So these are very difficult uh, questions uh, to answer. But, you know, with uh, some of my coworkers, we have started to look at them very seriously. And so just to give you the gist of of methods that are uh, being deployed and, and that people think about, what you can try to do is you can try to create for each feature, for each mutation you'd like to say whether it significantly affects a response, for example, the susceptibility to a certain form of cancer. Um, for each mutation, you're gonna create a fake mutation. And then you're gonna run your black box algorithm, these very complex algorithms, these very complex scoring machines on not only on the true mutation, the one that you've typed, but also on the fake one that you created uh, manually on your computer. And these methods have the property that by looking at what the black box does on, think, on fake mutations, it immediately informs the results of the black box on true mutations that may not have any effect on the phenotype you're looking at. And so, uh, this method will inform you that if you were to report a certain number of, of mutations, then it would inform you about the rate of re reproducibility 
of what you're about to communicate. And so maybe I'll skip these slides uh, uh, in the interest of time, but um, what this is, is like what I want to convey is that try to identify features that drive, like let's say a biological, uh, um, that drive a, a disease, that drive your cholesterol up is extremely important. And then we are starting to develop methods that can solve these problems, but of course much more, much work needs to, to be done. And what I want to say here is that mathematics really comes in as well. It is not, it's, to learn from data is extremely difficult. And this is where you need clarity of thought, you need mathematics, you need probability theory, and you need a lot of mathematics to be able to actually inform biologists about which mutations are actually um, uh, in, are in the pathway of, of your disease. Okay, and so these have been used to actually analyze real data from the UK Biobank, 350,000 patients of British ancestry typed at about a million locations, a million SNPs for those of you who know what I'm talking about. All right, and so this is a work in progress trying to reduce, develop new statistical techniques, trying to reduce the, the irreproducibility that we face in the sciences by offering a statistical tools that if applied correctly will control the rate of reproducibility of, of published research. The last point, if I have, do I have two or three minutes left or not? Or because I'm also okay to wrap up. Can I continue for two minutes or not? Hello? So the last, the, last, uh, the last point I want to say that, uh, that I alluded to earlier, which is that now we use these very complex models, these machine learning models in very sensitive applications. I don't know the state of affairs in Japan, but in the US I can tell you that uh, courts in the United States, judges use machine learning sent out tools to inform uh, decisions that they make. So for example, they're gonna run algorithms, there are companies selling software to the US government that will actually predict whether a certain defendant will commit another crime or not. And so now we're using machine learning in extremely sensitive applications to determine whether you get bail, to determine whether you get parole, to determine whether you get a loan, perhaps to determine if we are admitted to Stanford. And so when we do this, it's extremely important that we treat people fairly. That is, what if I have a machine learning algorithm that is very accurate for let's say the majority group for white males like myself, but is totally inaccurate on say females of African, of uh, American heritage. And so it's becoming extremely important to guarantee the fairness of these extremely complex systems. And so this is what we need to work on as a community. So the one important thing that we're gonna have to face in the next few years is is how do we communicate uncertainty to decision makers? How do we not overstate what we can learn from machine learning? How do we treat people equitably? And so right now, again, myself, but many others uh, in mathematics, in machine learning, in statistics are thinking about this problem. As we deploy these complex systems, how do we make sure that they treat people equitably? So one way to sort of think and formalize this is that it would be nice to have tools that do the following. Let's say I'm uh, looking at a student applying to Stanford. So every year Stanford has 60,000 candidates applying and clearly we're gonna use machine learning algorithm to try to predict whether these students will do well on the Stanford campus. And so we can measure lots of attributes, the high school they went to, their scores on various exams, their level of physical fitness, of preparation, and so on, the classes they take, and so on. These are the, what we're gonna call the covariates X. And then Y is how well you're gonna do. So for example, it might be your GPA, your point average after two years on campus. What I would like to be able to do is to be able to kind of, for an, a candidate, based on its, his or her um, characteristics, be able to produce a range for how well this person is gonna do at Stanford 
which is correct 90% of the time. That is, if I see a student, I want to predict the range, let's say the GPA will be between 3.4 and 3.8 for this student, and for another, it might be between 2.7 and 2.5, uh, 2.7 and 3.5, sorry. And I want this prediction to be correct in the sense that they need to hold 90% of the time, regardless of the group you belong to, so that they treat people equitably. That we don't want methods that are accurate on males, for example, and totally inaccurate on females. And we sort of know how to do this. We have come a long way. Um, we have proposed methods to achieve this, to try to kind of build wrapper around these very complex algorithms that would achieve one thing. And that thing is that they will provide decision makers with ranges that hold, that are accurate, no matter what group you belong to. So I understand that I uh, talk a lot about a lot of things, and I'm, I'm happy to pause and entertain questions. Uh, this is uh, uh, just to show you that, again, this is, this can, we can experiment with these ideas. In the next 10 years, um, I think that there's a lot of work for, you know, clearly we have entered in the data era. Um, there's a lot of mathematics that we need to develop for the data era. Everybody wants to use data to improve their business or their science, but believe me when I say that learning from data is not trivial. It is extremely important to be able to reason well statistically and mathematically, and that's why I think that the role of mathematics will can only increase in the future because everything is data-driven. Everything becomes quantitative, and that is the job of mathematicians to think about questions of this kind. Uh, with this, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Candace. We'd like to have time for only uh, one short question. Anyone who has an opinion or question, please raise your hand. No questions? You can ask a question both in English or Japanese. No questions? No? Okay. There seems to be no more questions. Uh, we will move on to the next presentation. Thank you very much again, Professor Candace. Next, please welcome Emeritus Professor Nishiura Yasumasa of Hokkaido University. He will give a talk on living, thermo uh, living thermometers in a society. Professor Nishiura, you have the floor, please. A couple of examples. Uh, uh, it's a, a partial outcome the, uh <coughs> of the uh, JSC activities uh, pressed on the class. And, uh, So yesterday we had a big discussion, many discussions about the uh, urgent issue. So we are living in an era of BUCA, that's the uh, relation of volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity, okay? And, uh, but of course, all these problems, so what's the origin? Of course, nobody knows, but uh, can we say a little bit more uh, scientific way? Uh, <coughs> of these uh, uh, difficulties. And uh, so already many people, novelists, uh, you know, uh, historian, economist, uh, discuss most, more or less a similar type of questions, difficulties from various viewpoints. Uh, this is a very popular book. And, uh, all of you know most of these authors. And, uh, but uh, as I said, if slightly rephrase these uh, 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 issues, a little bit more uh, mathematical way of uh, uh, saying, I summarize into the following five points. And the first one is uh, uh, infinity versus limit, uh, finiteness. So our desire is to extend to infinity, but uh, our planet, our globe, is just uh, finite. So it's, uh, it's uh, 
kind of a you know, conflict between uh, uh, infinity and uh, finiteness. The second one is uh, invisible. So, so who is responsible for these uh, difficult questions? It's very hard to say. So it's uh, because the, the real thing is becomes invisible for us. It's behind the scene. So it's very difficult to detect which actually you know, causes uh, 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 the uh, many problems. The third one is uh, not a simple cause and effect, uh, causality. It's uh, always uh, multiple uh, feedbacks loops is going on. So it's already, it's very hard to say uh, what is the origin, single origins, right? So for instance, uh, uh, perpetrators and the victims are either the same or difficult to distinguish, okay? The fourth one is uh, awareness of scale. So uh, especially we are, you know, we, we, we can live, uh, say, uh, even 100 years, it's very hard to recognize extremely slow change, right? So this is a scale problems. And the final one is, uh, so perhaps uh, all of you know, uh, we human beings think linearly, but uh, the reality is always nonlinear. So we tend to think current trends will continue forever, but uh, these trends could collapse at any time. Okay. Uh, so what my mission, my uh, message is how somehow make these issues by using mathematics more uh, recognizable, interpretable, and uh, computable. And so I summarize again the three lines. The, what's the functioning of mathematics? The first one is uh, recognizable because the, if the problem becomes very, very complex, then it's hard to put those things into the framework, mathematical framework. But if you succeed to do it, and then it, the problem becomes more easy, more transparent, and the way everybody recognizes what is the problem. Okay, that's very important uh, function of mathematics. And uh, reductions, already Professor Candace explained about the uh, 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 kind of a sparseness, et cetera. So reduction always another important function. So compressing with keeping essential features. Okay, and the third one is a predictability. So uh, once you have a nice uh, recognizable mathematical models and nice uh, 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 computational power, then you have a chance to predict in a reliable way. So in that case, uncertainty quantification with uh, a couple of the data simulation becomes more and more important. Okay, I pick up uh, uh, maybe six or five good examples. Shows uh, my title says uh, living theorem. So uh, in the society, so from these uh, <coughs> we have four. Uh, there are currently the three problems of this JST machine problem is running, and I pick up. Uh, several examples, and always I show you uh, these triplet. So the serum, coupled with some nice software, and then application to the society. Okay, the first one is the topology. Okay, so especially today I focus on the persistent homology. Uh, so I do not want to go into the detail, but anyway, there is a couple of rigorous result in this uh, field if you believe me, and these people, Hiraokas and Oversan, uh, develop extensively, especially in uh, applying the, the material science. And, uh, oh. For instance, if you have a big data, some data coming from, say, material science, and then you dump into the, uh, this software, then you get the, some, oh, sorry. Uh, some diagram. This is all more or less a two-dimensional. It's, so it's uh, big reductions, so from large amount of data to the almost 2D. And then once you, you know, reduce the whole problem to the 2D setting, then you have a chance to analyze what does it say, right? And, uh, and in fact, the persistent homology is very, very powerful because they can detect the size and shape, because originally the topologist uh, cannot distinguish uh, uh, cup and uh, uh, donuts, 
but now they are able to detect size and shape. So they can distinguish the uh, uh, complete perfect circle to the elongated one. So this is very good. And then you can uh, uh, find uh, more precise uh, information, uh, for instance, uh, connectivity and uh, ring structures and cavity in three dimensions. So this is a kind of a new non-invasive uh, mathematical tools uh, uh, measurement with huge reduction. Okay, I skipped this one. And for, in, for instance, so this is a bit more easy to see that if you want to distinguish the chair type uh, molecule and the boat type, and then this is a MD simulation, then applying using this data into the persistent diagram, then you can see uh, two clusters here. And this automatically, without any uh, 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 learning process, we can detect the uh, two different uh, 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 types of the molecules. So it's very powerful and uh, without the uh, learning process. So the second topic is flow. So it's already covers broad areas, but uh, focusing on the topological flow data analysis. And I show you one example, of what is called a COT. So maybe don't worry, understand the, the real meaning, but it's a kind of uh, abbreviation of the software or the, or the some uh, uh, jargon in the mathematics. And what is it? Okay, suppose you are given uh, some uh, flow around the Japan island, so you decompose the uh, four uh, continent and islands, A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, and then each component has a several uh, uh, subset of flows. And then you can assign the word for, to each the uh, component. And then you can get uh, some sort of uh, sent, kind of a sentence, sentence combination of the uh, uh, word coming from each component. Then eventually you have uh, some nice uh, one sentence. But actually, uh, there is a rigorous theorem. They, these people prove that the, uh, every structure is stable Hamiltonian vector uh, is a one-to-one -one correspondence with COT. COT is a kind of a sentence, right? So that, uh, uh, so in this one word, if you have a pro, then immediately you have a sentence. So sentence is much easy to understand and also manipulate and easy to understand the dynamics from one state to another one. So it's very nice if you have this kind of uh, conversion from pro to word. Uh, <clears throat> okay, and the second way they, they develop also the software of Cyclone and uh, word pops up almost in a second if you are given the flow. So it's like uh, if you know the chaotic dynamics, this is a finite dimensional case, and then you convert this dynamics into a symbolic kind of a shift dynamics like this. And then you understand the more details of the exchange of factors. And in this case, flow dynamics, so it's infinite dimensional, so much more complicated. However, you have a chance once you change into, uh, into a word dynamics. So this is great. This is a great reduction, mathematical power. And many, many applications, but I skip uh, even an in the industry, they already make uh, the real you know, manufacturing product using this uh, uh, techniques. Actually, I don't tell you the detail because of the uh, uh, non-disclosure agreement, so i sorry about that, but anyway, <laughs> uh, it's nice. So it's, uh, as I said, the uh, drastic data compression and uh, you know, quality of quantify latent knowledge behind flow patterns. So crowd, so this is relevant. Okay, I, I forgot to say that this is the number of the, our uh, moon <coughs> shaft problem. So crowd is relevant one and four and five category. So crowd is actually in this, what, I, what do I mean by crowd? It's a crowd control and uh, nishinari san actually uh, uh, extend a one-dimensional simple uh, uh, model for pedestrian to the two-dimensional one. So actually we have a big accident a couple of years ago, or maybe, maybe more than a couple of years ago in uh, Akashi, we have you know, many people died because of no control at all for the uh, motion of the crowd. <coughs> And uh, as you know, uh, maybe one, even one dimensional, this uh, ASAP models uh, are really captures uh, essential part of the uh, uh, jamming 
uh, process, uh, jutai in Japanese. Uh, and uh, actually, he applied his method to solve the uh, congestion or jamming or, you know, smooth control the, uh, uh, say, a Tokyo metro station and the airport and other areas. So this uh, 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 kind of a wisdom coming from mathematics is very helpful to control the, uh, reduce the air congestions. Uh, one thing I should say, uh, he also applied, once applied the nudge series. This is not the mathematics, but uh, maybe, maybe related to the LC, the other side, this morning we have uh, some discussions. So this is do not enforce a rule to, to the crowd, and, uh, l but that let them behave naturally. So it's like a, a basketball goal, uh, just above the uh, trash box, and then the people wants to slow the garbage into the, into the garbage box uh, without any, you know, uh, enforcing a rule. Or the footprint, an escalator, elevator, etc. So this is uh, really nice, combined with the mathematics and the nudge theory. Okay, uh, so already Professor Kandas explained a little bit uh, from a slightly different point of view, uncertainty. So uncertainty quantification is really important for various areas and uh, relevant to the, all the uh, 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 moonshot program, I guess. I, I explained a little bit uh, uh, <coughs> about uncertainties, so, you know, uncertainties is, is uh, unavoidable. You cannot escape from the, uh, these uncertainties. And uh, so that you have to assign uh, 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 PDF, the probability distribution functions, for instance, uh, initial data. You don't know exactly what is the initial data. You have to assign, uh, as a prior knowledge, the PDF. So question is how the probability distribution evolves with respect to time. And how do we control? How do we, you know, develop? And then to do that always becomes important uh, data, data simulations. So if you have a good data, then the distribution might shrink. So you have a more correct uh, 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 predi prediction. So combination uncertainty and uh, uh, simulation, data simulation is a very, very nice com a uh, 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 good way to predict your phenomenon. Okay, uh, so I don't have enough time to explain all the details, so the explanation is a little bit uh, superficial and oversimplified, but uh, this is like, uh, you know, the classical model is a Dirac delta to Dirac delta, so mathematical model maps one point to another point, but the uh, uh, <coughs> probability distribution is a sum, you have a sum distribution and in initial data, and this will be uh, mapped to the another distribution, but if you have, don't have any data, so this probability just uh, diffuse away. So you have not chance to control or pre not correct prediction. So you need a data to, to uh, these uh, probability distribution more, you know, uh, close to not the very, maybe not the direct delta, but a little bit more uh, in a controllable way. <coughs> So uh, maybe I skip this one. And uh, so in this case, the, what is the theorem? So Bayes theorem. So I think uh, most of you know this is the Bayes theorem. Given uh, uh, some free or brief, some distribution, and then uh, map to the uh, uh, posterior distribution. This is an improved one, uh, multiplied likelihood. So uh, I, but always we have to encounter uh, the, this curse of high dimensionality. So the problem is always maybe the infinite and the uh, data might be a very messy. So naively, if you apply this method, then you uh, encounter the uh, curse of what is called the curse of high dimensionality. So computation is intractable. Uh, even if you have a very, very super power computer, it's still not able to do it. Uh, so that now mathematics comes in, okay? Not only just uh, uh, <coughs> get the good data, you have to apply, for instance, uh, somehow you reduce, you have to reduce the size of the data you have to control. So I show you one example, that's the Lagrangian data, uh, Lagrangian uh, uh, manifold in oceanography. So in oceanography, of course, this is oversimplified, but anyway, 
the V, you have uh, get the information through the floating V uh, on the ocean, the surface of the ocean. Uh, but of course, the V does not move in a random way because flow itself has a kind of a special pattern like, like this. This is, a, of course, simplify, oversimplify, but the converse to along some red curve. So we call this kind of, of course, much more sophisticated, but the manifold, the Lagrangian manifold. And then if you focus on, uh, on uh, this uh, reduced manifolds, then you have a chance to control and predict the motion, oceanography, right? So this kind of reduction is very, very useful in oceanography. And uh, even if you have a big uncertainties, you have a chance, a little bit more you know, precise and uh, <coughs> reliable uh, evolution of this uh, sensory width. Okay, uh, but of course, the, uh, <coughs> you know, a couple of months ago, we have a severe damage because of the uh, big typhoon and the flooding everywhere. So when evacuate the home, where is a safer place? This is very urgent and uh, very quick decision making is always necessary. And uh, so one of the Miyoshi's group uh, is also working Crest big data applications. He, their group developed a very nice uh, 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 mm, mathematical models combined with a data simulation. So, a little bit surprising result is that within 30 minutes, so this is a very uh, uh, extreme heavy rain in a localized place. And you have to predict, uh, announce a, a warning sign to the living people, people living there within uh, maybe one hour, possibly within 30, 30 minutes. And they do it, they did it. Uh, but still we, have, we need a supercomputer to predict the when and where this kind of heavy uh, uh, rain uh, <coughs> you have, you may have. But anyway, this is a good example for the uh, uh, society. Okay, pandemic, maybe I have, uh, I don't know, I, how, how, how much I still, I have five minutes, four minutes. Still okay? Okay, good, thanks. So pandemic, uh, <coughs> one and two, uh, missions uh, relevant and uh, so pandemic uh, or this diseases this is a bit tight. so again another issue not me it's uh, it's not brother not my brother but uh, my good friend uh, he's working on uh, this uh, infectious diseases he's also busy man and uh, 24 hours once some pandemic pops up but anyway in this case uh, data-driven analysis, but also I will uh, in, say uh, very microscopic. Microscopic mean that uh, the virus, say a flu or uh, uh, African spine, whatever, the uh, change is very rapidly. So it's a genomic level of the microscopic uh, viewpoint. So you have to understand how they change uh, every year or every month. But on the other hand, at the population levels, the, this uh, pandemic, how to control the, uh, at, the, at the macroscopic level. So this problem is a very, from microscopic genetic level to the, to the population level. And also data driven, of course. And uh, he's one of the uh, leading person in Japan, works very hard in this direction. But one should, I should say one thing, even in, the, in those you know, data driven type analysis are simply looking uh, kind of a conceptual model, also works very well. So it's a nice combination, it's very conceptual, simply looking model and the data driven and uh, you know, with a high uh, performance computers. So good combination is always important. Uh, robotics, uh, move before think. This is a bit of strange English, but maybe a leap before one looks, maybe a more appropriate. appropriate. Uh, I don't have enough time, but I just show you a movie. This is, this is they made, uh, their group made uh, this kind of robot this has not the central nervous system. They just move around, explore, and uh, avoid the obstacles, and almost looks like a real uh, uh, centipede, locomotion by pure. Implicit control is very, very in interesting uh, control. It's uh, completely different from conventional one. But the mathematics comes in, actually, uh, if you understand the, uh, <coughs> the detail, but I skip it. Today's, uh, yeah, this is really a nice. Actually, there is a product kind of uh, 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 toy which uh, mimicking this kind of behaviors if you have a chance to buy it in Japan. Okay, uh, 
and a cardiovascular problem. So <laughs> relevant to uh, mission one and two, but uh, this one is, uh, is uh, one of the parents of Professor Sweeter where we explain about this a bit belief details later, so I skip uh, 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 this slide, but uh, maybe related to some part to the first the second talk. Okay, uh, yes, extracted. This is an algorithm from implicit knowledge of the medical doctors. This is very important. Okay, finally, but not the least, uh, <coughs> uh, mathematics has a very nice, a uh, good affinity to the social scientists or, or ma humanity peoples. So this is one. Uh, Example, I like the definition of this uh, commons. The commons, the uh, ensemble of resources that human beings hold in commons, trust to use on behalf of themselves, and, uh, and the past and future generation of human beings. This is very nice, uh, it, although it's a verbal way of saying, but nice definition of the commons. So what the problem we are facing in the past slide, I show you, you know, climate change and uh, biodiversity, energy, and the such is uh, in a sense the commons our commons, the problem arising in, in the common. So in, from that viewpoint, they discussed, of course, not the, uh, not the scientific way, but, uh, sorry. But uh, these people are discussing, uh, in a sense, uh, similar kind of problems in this book. Sorry, Japanese, but uh, the title says the commons in the modern society, beyond the publicness. Okay, uh, so I, uh, yeah, I skip this slide and I jump into the uh, final two slides. So, untangle B, U, C, A, volatility, uncertainty, et cetera, et cetera. So, we must imagine should the, uh, uh, clarify the meaning uh, quantitatively, what is uncertainty. And uh, so many people say that the toy model and Celico have nothing to do with the reality, okay? And I'm more interested in how to survive today, not tomorrow. but. The problem is actually the, the other way around, so we have to, we must question, is a responsible to more clear statement about uncertainties. And uh, recover reliability of scientific approaches, and, uh, and the thirdly extract the fundamental mathematical scheme to uh, come on to these issues. So we, to do that, we need a kind of a big platform to discuss all these issues. Okay, this is the final slide. So again, back to the functioning of mathematics. So I said first, the uh, recognizable. So if you don't understand what is the problem, then nothing happens. So we have to uh, 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 model the complex uh, uh, issues, difficult issues in the mathematical framework. And then the reductions uh, to handle the complex issues. Without reduction, sometimes very hard to understand itself. Of course, there are many, many questions already Professor Candace uh, uh, <coughs> uh, uh, showed us uh, the interpretivity of the uh, 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 deep network, for instance. But anyway, we have a step-by-step -step understand the, uh, the details. The third one is predictable, and uh, predictability makes the future a better price. So uh, again, uh, in order to find uh, reliable, uh, to make the reliable predictions, we have to understand uncertainties Maybe with data is also present important. Okay, thank you very much for your listening and attention. Thank you very much, Professor Nishura. And now we'd like to have time for only one short question. Anyone who has an opinion, please raise your hand. Any questions? No questions? Okay. So there seems to be no questions. We'll move on to the next presentation. Thank you very much again, Professor Nishura. <laughs> and next, please welcome Professor Christian Raj, Deputy Director of Institute for Pure and Applied Mathematics, University of California, Los Angeles, to give a talk on good practice at IPAM, the impact of mathematics on other sciences and society. Professor Raj, the floor is yours. Okay. Okay, 
first of all, um, I would like to uh, thank you for having me here. This is really an uh, interesting uh, symposium. So um, <clears throat> I'm uh, from uh, the uh, Institute for Pure and Applied Mathematics at uh, UCLA. And I think what I will do in this talk is, is I will um, describe in the first part, uh, uh, I will introduce IPEM. I will tell you why we exist, uh, what's our mission, and what are the activities we do to fulfill this mission. And then in the second part of my talk, I will um, give you some uh, examples of what I would call success stories uh, of uh, what we have done at IPEM, which hopefully will connect to uh, what we try to uh, learn about here at, in this uh, Moonshot uh, Symposium. <laughs> so um, first, uh, you know, um, the first slide here says, why do we need a math institute? And um, I might be preaching to the choir here, but uh, let me just say a few words here, and we could add, of course, an hour of discussion if we wanted to. So, so um, I, I think everybody agrees that um, mathematics is increasingly central to science, and mathematics is also increasingly central to society. And uh, when I say that, what I mean by that is, is uh, if I'm thinking about the sciences, there's no doubt that, you know, we can now more and more uh, do simulations and modeling of, of problems of uh, interest, and we rely a lot more on our algorithms, and that's, of course, uh, mathematics. And then, of course, in the last uh, five to eight years or so, Machine learning has really appeared uh, everywhere uh, in any sciences, so that's also a um, really important uh, uh, application. In society in general, it's very similar. Um, many uh, applications, many things we do depend on machine learning, and uh, there's mathematics, and uh, we have heard, uh, for example, by Professor Candes' talk, that now we have to deal with things like uh, imperfect uh, or biased data, uh, we have heard that we need to uh, think about uncertainty qualification, uh, quantification and many things. So clearly mathematics is everywhere and um, progress in all these areas depends of, uh, uh, you know, on developing new tools uh, in mathematics. Um, and um, yeah, so and in order to address these uh, challenges, the National Science Foundation of the United States has, uh, has an institute program. They support uh, of, uh, six uh, math institutes at this point, and the Institute for Pure Applied Mathematics, which I am from, is one of these institutes. So, um, and that's why I'm here to talk a little bit about uh, uh, IPAM. So first, uh, let me talk a little bit, a little bit about uh, IPAM's mission. So as I said, we are an institute located uh, on the campus of uh, UCLA in uh, sunny California. Um, and our mission can really be uh, summed up by the very first bullet points there. Uh, that IPEM brings together mathematics and domain sciences, or multiple areas of mathematics. And we bring people together from different areas to foster interactions between mathematics and the sciences, or between different areas of mathematics, and to build new research communities uh, between these different areas. And the reason why I say this is we all know, I, I hope we all know and we all agree, that mathematics is central to many you know, engineering or other societal issues, but often neither mathematicians nor the applied scientists know about this and know how to talk to each other. So what our goal is, is to bring these people together to IPEM for an extended period of time so that they actually learn from each other and start working to each other. We also want to break down what we call linguistic barriers because often people literally need to learn how to speak to each other because mathematic mathematicians, as we all know, have a certain uh, jargon that is not always uh, uh, easy to understand for non-mathematicians. So that's one of our goals. And you know, also we want to highlight important mathematical problems and uh, you know, explore uh, uh, possible approaches. Um, in addition to all of that, of course, IPAM uh, wants to develop human resources. We focus on uh, training the next generation of, uh, of a scientist at IPAM. Uh, oops, excuse me. We want to, of course, promote mathematics as a driving force for innovation. Um, promote mathematics in application, but also applications driving mathematics. And an example for that is, for example, machine learning. Everybody knows about machine learning, and we all know that neural networks work spectacularly well, but we really don't know why they work so well. And there's a lot of mathematics that's missing there, and that's also one of the missions uh, of what we want to do. And just more generally, what we want to do is engage and transform the world through mathematics. And all of this is summed up through our tagline, Math Changes Everything. That's the IPEM uh, slogan. So um, how do we do all of that? Um, that's kind of like, um, we have a number of activities, and I would say the most important are what we call long programs that last three months. And these long programs are programs on certain topics where we bring together 40 to 50 people who come to IPEM for the entire time. There's a number of uh, workshops. Um, oh, actually, this is my next slide. So we have these long programs, I'm sorry. Um, and then we also have uh, shorter workshops, we have summer schools, and we have uh, outreach activities 
and uh, industrial uh, activities. And um, I'm showing you this, uh, this uh, picture here to show you that really only half of our participants are from mathematics, or slightly more than half, and then we have participants from all kinds of other areas, and that again uh, emphasizes what I said before, that we bring together math and other disciplines to really bridge uh, the gap and build new communities, um, and that's really uh, important. And uh, one thing one always asks, do we always get the same people? And I also want to show this really quickly here. Uh, we actually like this slide. This is the, uh, num the uh, number of distinct participants at IPAM as a function of time. And what you're supposed to see here is that we have a steady influx of new people coming to IPAM. Because sometimes people criticize, well, do we have the same like few hundred math people who come to IPAM all the time? They're just kind of like the inbred thing. No, we always have new people related to the new topics. So this has been working for the last 20 years in a rather successful way. So um, in a little bit more detail, I want to talk a little bit more about these long programs, which are really, in my opinion, the most important activity uh, we have uh, at IPAM. And um, these long programs, as I said before, uh, last uh, three months. And what we do in these long programs is, is we bring together a group of uh, what we call core people, who are typically of the order of uh, 40 or 50 uh, uh, people. They spend the entire three months at IPAM, and as I said, they are from mathematics, they are from engineering, they are from physics, sometimes they are from social sciences, from computer science, so very broad. And during those three months when they are at IPAM, we have what we call tutorials. That's kind of like to teach some common language. As I said before, that's really important to kind of like bring people up to speed. How do the other people in this group here think about certain problems? And then we have a number of, uh, of, uh, of uh, workshops, typically three or four. We have what we call a culminating workshop. And then when we don't have workshops at IPAM, we have a number of other activities. We have seminars, we have working groups, we have career panels for the young people. At the end of the program, we often uh, ask participants to write a white paper, which kind of like summarizes the state of the art of this particular topic. And by the way, all of these white papers are on our webpage if you're interested. Um, <clears throat> and one thing I also want to point out that I think is important is, is we have a lead time for these long programs that is of the order of two to two and a half years. In other words, between approving a long program by our science board and it actually happening, only two years pass, which is actually very short if you think about organizing something for three months with all these different people. So that's actually one great thing that, that, we ca that, can, that can act rather quickly. Uh, our one-week workshops, by the way, have a lead time of only uh, one year. Um, on the right here, I show you a list of all of our long programs of the last seven years. I'm not going through this list, but as you probably read it a little bit, you see we have a broad range of topics, anything from traffic flow to big data and computation to gravitational waves, tensor methods. So it's a very broad spectrum of uh, topics that uh, we cover at IPAM. I also mentioned that we have uh, outreach uh, and uh, workforce development activities. And I would say one of the uh, most important and most successful programs we have is our uh, RIPS program, which stands for Research and Industrial Projects for Students. And the basic idea of this program is in this first line here, that we have um, typically nine projects at uh, IPAM at UCLA that are sponsored by industrial partners. And each project uh, is worked on by a team of four students, they're undergraduate students. And it's remarkable what these, nine, what these students can do in a period of uh, nine weeks. Often that leads to publications and our sponsors are, are very happy. We have now, um, here's actually a list of all the sponsors we had in this past year. And by just looking through this list, you see these are very uh, uh, relevant uh, companies in the United States. So, so the companies really value this uh, program. We have now um, um, expi expanded this RIPS program to other locations. We have a RIPS program in Singapore. And then we have a graduate version of it, which we call GRIPS. One of them is in uh, Sendai, and Professor Suito will talk about it, I believe, a little bit later. And we have also a graduate version of this RIPS program in Berlin, uh, Germany. And again, you see the companies are, are very important uh, companies in the respective uh, countries. Um, we also have some other special programs. We have outreach programs, we have industrial short courses, we have public lectures, and many other uh, activities um, you know, that I'm not even going to touch on here today. Um, so this is kind of like in a nutshell, what is IPAM doing, what is our mission, uh, what do we try to accomplish, and now of course the question is, does it work? Do we actually, are we successful doing what we want to do? And um, in the second half or second part of my talk here, I will now give you a few examples how I believe uh, this, uh, this, um, this, this worked. So here I have a, you know, a timeline and I picked a few, I think I picked uh, seven different uh, 
uh, programs or seven different topics, and I have a couple slides on average for each of these things that I'm going to go through uh, in the next, uh, I believe, 15 minutes or so. So first, I want to talk about one program that might have been one of our most successful programs. It was called Multiscale Geometry and Analysis in High Dimensions. And in fact, uh, we already heard a lot about it because um, um, Emmanuel Candes and uh, Terry Tao, Donahoe, and uh, Romberg were all uh, participants in this program. And in fact, this whole compressed sensing idea, which we learned about uh, uh, two talks earlier, was really started at IPAM. In fact, those people, you know, they met at IPAM, and that's where they came up with this idea. This is where they tested all of this, and, you know, the first results Professor Candes showed a little while ago were really obtained at IPAM. And, you know, they would have never met unless they hadn't they come to IPAM for this, uh, for this three months program. So we think that this is really one of the big success stories, and we all know, of course, there are many applications. Uh, MRI is probably one of the most important ones, certainly in the field of uh, medicine, and again, Professor Candes talked about it uh, quite a bit. I'm not going to say more about it. I think we all heard about it already a little while ago, so I'm going to move on. And um, <coughs> a year later, in 2005, we had a long program on multiscale physics in material science and biophysics. And um, I actually think this was an important program because this really was uh, one program that, that helped to make a strong connection between mathematics and material sciences in the United States. And I want to give you uh, uh, one example in a second. Uh, uh, but first, you know, I want to uh, talk a little bit about why multiscale modeling material sciences, what does this mean? And I have shown you here a uh, view graph, which you probably have seen in some variation many, many times. There are many ways to present what I've shown here. But roughly speaking, what I want to show you on this view graph here is this, that in material sciences, we have a hierarchy of modeling approaches going from like the smallest scale based on quantum mechanics to the larger scale, kind of like a continuum models. And what I show on the x and y axis, uh, you know, you can actually label them differently. But what I'm showing you here is on the x axis, kind of like how big a system can you, um, can you describe with this approach or what time of time scale can you um, describe with this approach. And, you know, it's a log scale, and you might argue that, you know, it might be slightly to the left or to the right, but, you know, since it's a log scale, it doesn't really matter that much. <laughs> and on the y-axis, uh, on this view graph, I show you accuracy. So basically, the most expensive quantum mechanical methods are extremely accurate of the order of milli-electron volts is the accuracy, but you really can only describe systems that are maybe 10 or whatever atoms uh, in size. Uh, slightly bigger, there's something called density functional theory, which, which physicists and material scientists like a lot, you know, it's not quite that accurate, but still very accurate. Uh, you can go to bigger systems. And then as you go up this ladder here, you know, we have uh, empirical um, methods. All of these methods, by the way, still kind of like include electrons. All of these methods don't. And then we have sort of like uh, interatomic uh, potentials that are more empirical, coarse grain models, and at the upper scale continuum models, um, you know, that obviously lose a lot of information, but we can go to bigger scales. And one important statement I want to make is this, there's not like a good or a bad methods in these methods. They're all valid on their respective scales. And that really is the important question is how do we connect these approaches and how do we inform one methods from what we learn from the other? And that's what's part of this program on multi-scale modeling in material sciences uh, that we had at IPAM uh, a number of years ago. And one example which I want to show, and I like this because it happens to be my own research, is uh, modeling what's called um, epitaxial growth. There's a cartoon version that shows you what is epitaxial growth. It is basically um, the process where atoms are deposited on a substrate and then they form thin films. And you can now model this atomistically, and physicists have done this for a long time by, for example, doing something which is called the kinetic Monte Carlo simulation, where we resolve every atoms. And what we learned in this program, this multi-scale modeling program, is this, how can we actually use continuum type models that are based on partial differential equations to kind of like get to coarser and bigger scales. And uh, you know, for the experts in here, uh, we use what's called the level set method where we have a level set equation. We solve a diffusion equation for the atoms. Um, I don't want to go into the details here. What I really want to show you is that this is an example where we can now describe this with more continuum type methods where some of these parameters, for example, this D here, are actually calculated with quantum mechanical methods. So these methods at the very low end here and then, you know, get some results. And here's a typical uh, simulation of what we get. So what I show you here is not an atomistic simulation, but what I show you here is a visualization of solving a continuum equation. It's a continuum equation for the level set method. So that's one example I want to discuss. 
Another example out of the material science world was our program in 2011 called Navigating Chemical Compound Space. And that was a really important and su successful program at IPAM because this was really the first time where we linked machine learning and material science and machine learning on high throughput uh, 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 scanning. And um, I want to um, you know, explain a little bit what this means. So um, here I show you um, what is chemical compound space and why is navigating chemical compound space so important. On the right, I show you two typical small molecules that probably everybody is, uh, you know, has some um, interest in on an everyday basis. Um, these are small molecules in the sense that the heavy atoms number less than 20, and there are actually some papers and arguments that say you have of the order of 10 to the 60 small molecules, at least in principle. And if you just think for a moment, 10 to the 60 is a really, really big number. And, um, you know, therefore, if you want to, for example, develop new drugs that are based on smaller molecules, we need to have some sort of um, method to scan configuration space in an you know, inefficient way. We can never do 10 to the 60, but at least we want to do something you know, more than 10 to the 1 or 10 to the 2. So how do we do this? So, um, so as I said, we do need efficient sampling methods <coughs> for this uh, compound space. And we also need efficient methods to calculate properties for our, uh, for, for our possible candidates. And it um, turns out that one very popular and one very accurate method to, for example, calculate the energy of a molecule is this density functional theory, which I mentioned earlier. But for a typical molecule to evaluate the energy takes, say, of the order of an hour. And um, well, 10 to the 60 hours is a very long time, so um, that's not really possible. But even a smaller number, one hour is very, very long. And um, <coughs> what happened in this program in 2011 is, is that we actually were able to uh, use machine learning to speed this up quite a bit. OK, OK, we're still here. Um, very good. Um, so this view graph actually <coughs> explains this, uh, what happened in this 2011 program. Um, <coughs> maybe I should start with the key players. So these people here, uh, Anatol von Lienfeld, Klaus Müller, and Alex Tachenko, they didn't know each other before 2011. They met for the first time at IPAM at this long program, and they, they realized, uh, Müller as a machine learner, these are uh, physicists and chemists, they realized that machine learning can really contribute. So they started sitting together at the beginning of the program. At the end of the program, they wrote already a paper, which led to this, uh, this curve here. So let me explain this curve. What I show you here is, um, well, you see it's accurate as a function of training size. But what, what, what they did is the following. They used what's called the QM9 data set that contains 134,000 small molecules. They have DFT, so quantum mechanically accurate uh, energies for all of these 134,000 molecules. And they now use the machine learning model to predict these energies. And what you basically see here is, is the training set of the, uh, of the machine learning method is of the order of 10 or 20K. The accuracy of the prediction is of the order of 0.3 electron volt, which is not spectacular, but it's already pretty good. And as expected, as you increase the training size, the accuracy goes down. This was 2011, uh, 12, actually 11, with kernel rich methods. And since then, many people have done similar things for this QM9 data set using machine learning. Now everybody is using deep learning, of course, and neural networks. And you see now in 2018, this black curve here is from 2018, you see that with a training set of, of the order of uh, uh, 10,000 uh, molecules, um, the accuracy is below the stashed line, which is what's called chemical accuracy. 1 MeV, so it's extremely accurate. In fact, it's ac as accurate as a truly quantum mechanical calculation. And that is a spectacular success because, you know, these calculations only take about a millisecond rather than an hour. So it's a speed up of six orders of magnitude, maybe even more, maybe with smaller methods, we can get seven, eight, maybe 10 orders of magnitude, quite a bit. So, and, you know, this is just for energies. We have similar results now for forces, other properties. Um, the next thing is, is to use machine learning for other quantities of interest. And, uh, you know, I just sort of like want to say that this, of course, now also leads to more IPAM programs. We have another IPAM program on a similar topic in uh, 2022. 20, uh, so this is uh, this machine learning uh, in material uh, science application. I gave you two examples of what I thought were really successful activities uh, at IPAM. Actually, I have a little more to say about this prog problem here because, um, you know, another uh, question one can ask is, is what is the... Uh, 
impact of machine learning for materials, uh, uh, for material sciences. And uh, we like this view graph here because what I show you here is this data from the Web of Science um, for papers that use the words machine learning and DFT. And you see that basically there were very few papers until 2011, and then the whole thing takes off, and this IPAM program I just described was in 2011. So clearly you see there was a huge impact of the IPAM program uh, on, uh, on this topic and bringing together material sciences and machine learning. And also if you look at, for example, the professional societies, you look at, uh, at the APS, MRS, SIEM meeting, you basically can see if you look back at previous programs until 2010, Nobody ever talked about machine learning, and since 2011, you now have many sessions and symposia at all of these meetings that deal with machine learning and material sciences. So clearly, this program at IBM had a huge impact on the community, and we believe it was very successful. In 2012, we had a summer school on deep learning. I'm not really going to talk about it much. I don't have a slide prepared, but I do want to say that in 2012, this was just around the time when machine learning took off. And in fact, we take credit actually for, you know, really helping to end this, what's called the AI winter. This was a summer school at IPAM. IPAM. The organizers included uh, Hinton, Lacoon, and Bengio. They were the organizers of the school. And we all know they won the Turing Prize, uh, I believe, earlier this year. And, uh, you know, this was, uh, of course, uh, something very successful that got restarted at IPAM uh, seven years ago. Um, my next example is, uh, this program in 2015, New Directions in Mathematical Approaches for Traffic Flow Management. And I will show you an example uh, in, uh, for, in the control of autonomous vehicles and what can be done. Um, again, this was work that was done of I at IPAM by people who didn't know each other before. I forgot to give credit, but the people behind it are, um, are um, Dan Work and Benny Seibold, a mathematician and a traffic engineer. They were both at IPEM for three months for this long program. And this work here was inspired by an experiment that my, some of you I'm sure know. It's a very famous Nagoya traffic experiment from 2008 that shows that if you put cars on a circular road and let people just drive, follow the car in front of you, you will very soon get what's called a fan film traffic dance. And um, this is actually something that can be modeled very simply with a set of coupled ODEs, the ones I show you here. And if you do this, you see the simulation result here. These cars are driving happily around the circle, and in the simulation, very quickly, you see that you get these, uh, these phantom traffic jams that then travel backwards. Um, so um, this is exactly the same that was observed in this experiment here. Turns out, if you now introduce an autonomous vehicle, just one, the blue one, which has a similar ODE, this one here, but these parameters, now they're not alphas, but they're beta, are slightly different. If you choose the right set of parameters, now the autonomous vehicle is active. Now it, so this means the blue a a atom car now does something different than all the red cars. This traffic jam disappears. So one autonomous vehicle in something like this can basically remove a, a phantom traffic jam. And this is just a simulation. And um, you know, of course, we also want to see an experiment. And I'm showing you um, now also uh, an experiment that was conducted by the people who met at IPAM. Actually, this was done at the University of Arizona. These were the people, mathematicians, engineers, who came up with this experiment. They put drivers in cars, just drive around the circle, very similar to the Nagoya traffic experiment. And you see that these uh, phantom traffic jams uh, happen. And then after a certain time, I believe at t equal to 120, um, no, this is the upper, after a certain time, one car is an autonomous vehicle, this grayish one here, and you see that this traffic jam doesn't completely disappear, but it's a lot less worse than it was in the beginning. And they have sensors on all these cars, and they can show that the throughput uh, is of the order of 20% better, fuel efficiency is better. Many things improve by just introducing one autonomous vehicle in the circle of roughly uh, 20 cars or so that drive around the circle. And we are pretty confident that this, of course, would also happen on an open road when cars just uh, follow each other. And uh, <coughs> this has then uh, stimulated um, a new IPAM program that will happen this coming fall, we have a program on uh, autonomous uh, vehicles, where of course some of the people from this previous program will be, and there will also be a lot of uh, uh, other people coming uh, to IPAM to talk more about autonomous vehicles and how mathematics can help with autonomous vehicles. And there we, of course, talk about, um, you know, something like what I just described here. Um, we also need um, to, uh, to look at um, 
you know, improving sensors, perception, and so on. So this will be a very interesting uh, program with many interesting uh, mathematical questions. Um, in 2016, we had a program on culture analytics. I'm not going to say more about it because it's my understanding that the next spe uh, speaker will talk a little bit more about the interaction between mathematics and the uh, social sciences. But I want to give you one example of what happened in this program. And um, this is uh, shown here. So the idea of this culture analytics program was to uh, connect researchers from the humanities and social scientists with mathematics and uh, data sciences, because now data-driven analysis of culture is, is, is a reality. And one example um, is, for example, uh, what, I'm what I'm saying here in these, uh, uh, in these bullet points, that if you have a network, uh, a social network, you know, you can actually do a network analysis to understand the spread of news. And this means you can also, for example, understand the <coughs> spread of fake news. And we all know fake news is something that's becoming more and more important. It influences societies, it influences people, it influences politics and elections and so on. And you know, one question people ask in this program, for example, is can we use a network analysis to do computation to actually check computationally whether or not some news that are being spread are real or fake news? That I think would be something very important because as I just said, this is an important <coughs> um, issue and problem that society uh, faces these days. So I think I'm out of, my, out, out of time, and um, this is my conclusion slide. So one more time, what I've done in this talk is this. I have described uh, IPAM, the Institute for Pure and Applied Mathematics, and again, our main mission is, is to foster the interactions of mathematics with a broad range of sciences and technologies. And because of, with this, we build new interdisciplinary research communities that can tackle many important societal problems many problems that are essential in the uh, Moonshot Initiative, and I'm sure we will talk about this a little bit later in uh, uh, our discussion. And uh, with this, I would uh, like to uh, finish and take uh, any question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Raj. So we'd like to have time for only one question. Any questions? No? Uh, thank you very much for your two uh, uh, presentation and the uh, we all know the when we tackle the social problem uh, multidisciplinary discussion is very important and so that's how IPAM was successful yeah. and actually I was very much impressed when I attend the workshop on quantum computer at IPAM it's uh, the, the people from mathematics uh, chemistry physics engineering even industry people uh, they discuss really discuss but here, when we ask a question, nobody raises hand and uh, no <laughs> discussion at all. How you make that kind of uh, atmosphere when uh, people ask question yeah. and uh, serious discussion? Um, that's a good question. I mean, I, I, we of course encourage people to ask questions all the time, but I think we have an environment that really helps. We, um, we in a typical workshop, we only have uh, five talks, so there's plenty of time. We let people know that there's plenty of time. We build in a lot of discussion time. We have uh, a lot of time between talks. After every talk, there's a break where people could have either formal or less formal discussions with each other. And we have a space that also encourages this. We have like a lobby with blackboards, whiteboards. There are always refreshments. So I think all of these things uh, help. Um, and you know, also we of course we always encourage the organizers to kind of like um, um, also help to encourage the discussion. Um, so yeah, you need to get it started somehow, but I think creating the right environment uh, is really a, a, a good start. Uh, yeah, so I think uh, atmosphere and the environment and uh, the that kind of a uh, uh, platform is very important. Uh, here, maybe I made a mistake that I said uh, only one short question that gives uh, people pressure not to ask, uh, so it's my fault. But thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much again, Professor Raj. <laughs> Next, please welcome Dr. Wim Van Salus, president of the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences to give a talk on the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics for the Moonshot program. Dr. Sal Luce, we join from Amsterdam via Skype. Dr. Sal Luce, please. Good afternoon, Tokyo. 
It's a great honor for me to join you here at this session within the Moonshot program and hopefully to contribute to the uh, reflection on the use of mathematics for the Moonshot program. You see that I've chosen a rather uh, extravagant title, The Reasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics for the Moonshot program, which of course is an allusion to uh, an old paper by Eugene Wigner from the 1960s. He's a physicist and he wrote a rather famous paper, The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics in the Natural Sciences. Now that was much more a philosophical article uh, about how it is that we can, in some sense, the wonder that, the, that we can use mathematics to describe the physical world. Um, I will be much more mundane and practical um, and try to convince you my view as a physicist that uh, mathematics can really contribute a lot to the Moonshot program, but also to mathematics. Um, I've been asked to first give you a bit of a feel for my own background. And so here is a slide on my career. I started as a, uh, as a I'm trained as a theoretical physicist and got my PhD in Leiden in 1982. Um, then I moved to the United States where I worked at AT&T Bell Labs, which at the time was one of the prime uh, industrial research labs in the United States doing fundamental research. There were a few Nobel Prizes awarded to people at Bell Labs. But for me, it also changed my view and my way of doing physics and science quite a bit. Um, the training in Leiden was much more on formal methods, uh, whereas at Bell Labs, I was in some sense forced by the atmosphere and the culture there to start with the phenomena and then to try to use, to apply insights from theoretical physics and mathematics to it. And you'll see that come back. Um, after eight years in the United States, I moved back to uh, the Netherlands, to Leiden, where I became a professor. And um, as I'll show you in a second, I was also the founder of the Lawrence Center. Um, I made a step away from physics, uh, or at least from doing active research, for about seven years when I was the director of the physics research organization FOM, we say FOM in the Netherlands, which is an organization that runs three research institutes and uh, was at the time responsible for funding of the, uh, the physics field in the Netherlands. I'm back in Leiden now as a physicist. I'm lecturing again, but I'm spending most of my time since about a year and a half as the president of the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences, which includes all the fields in the natural sciences, social sciences, humanities, and medical sciences. Now, more scientifically, my background is in the field of what we call pattern formation in non-equilibrium systems. For some of you in the audience, uh, <clears throat> it, it's quite closely related to, for, say for instance, to coupled uh, partial differential equations, formation of patterns and structures in them. And I've shown on the right a little picture of patterns in uh, rayleigh binar system. This is actually photos from real systems where you treat, where you heat a fluid layer from below and you see the emergence of nice conduction patterns. It's an, uh, a topic that I've worked on myself. Um, some of the people in the audience may know some of the work that I've done on the complex Ginsburg-Landau equation, which is, if you wish, the amplitude equation for uh, traveling wave systems where you have instabilities. And I wrote a long paper with uh, analyzing sources, sinks, fronts, and other structures uh, in this equation. And it has, was in a way the first, uh, the first paper on this topic, and many mathematicians have actually picked up on, on this interesting topic. A bit further away from mathematics, I worked on granular media, instabilities in flows in particular. I made some interesting predictions for the instabilities in polymer flows, which have recently been uh, confirmed in experiments that are actually interesting in uh, instabilities that were originally not expected. 
But the topic that I will concentrate on uh, for you today as an illustration of my main theme is a topic of front propagation into unstable states. I'll turn to that in a second, on which I learned uh, I worked on and off from 1988 till about 2004 when I wrote a review uh, article about it, basically also with the intention to share my insight sites and then turn it to the mathematicians and colleagues like you to say now this is what I can do, but now hopefully you can take over. And at the bottom you see the uh, logo of the Lawrence Center. I've been asked by the organizers to also tell you a little bit about the Lawrence Center, which is a workshop center in Leiden that I was the co-founder of and I was the first director of it for uh, the first 12 years. I'll do that at the end. So now to um, my example of front propagation into unstable states as the illustrating the power of mathematics, but also what a thinking about real problems can do to uh, uh, or can, can give new mathematics. Um, I assume that most people in the audience here will uh, recognize here at the top an example of the so-called Fisher equation, which was developed in uh, as an example of the study of fronts in, um, uh, in population dynamics. Uh, it's treated in the book on the left, Mathematical Biology. It has its own chapter on it. And the essence of it is that you see a, think of U as a variable that is a density of species, uh, which you can see has spatial interaction due to spreading. Uh, growth, you see the, the second term on the right hand side plus u is showing that when u is small it tends to grow because it's uh, the term by itself with the uh, time derivative on the left leads to exponential growth. But when u is large, becoming large enough, the last term on the right gives you saturation because it has a minus u cube term. Now, um, if you add, yes, um, you see I've tried to show with three little pictures that if you start with the situation on the top at t equals zero times zero, where u is only non-zero in a small region, say it could be compact support, then of course in that region uh, u starts to grow because of this, this linear term on the right, but it also spreads. And what this means that it, after a while it can lead to the situation at t equals t1, where uh, this region, and I'm only showing the right hand side, it will only spread, also spread to the left, but it is growing out, and but also spreading. But once U is large enough, you see that the saturation leads to a plateau where U doesn't grow anymore. Now, and so after a long time, you have a situation on the bottom, on the right, on the on the lower bottom, uh, where you see a, what we call a well-developed front. Now, for this rather relatively simple Fisher equation, in some sense, the, the main question you can ask about this is, what is the uh, front speed, the asymptotic front speed in such a problem? And uh, this front itself is featureless, so that's the only interesting uh, type of problem you can ask. But in more complicated cases that I will illustrate with pictures later, you can also sometimes have fronts that leads to pattern that lead to patterns, and then you can also ask questions about can I say something about the pattern that is generated by the front. Now, this problem has been studied in mathematics uh, for a long time, and uh, a very well known result is that by Arnsen and Weinberger who showed, for instance, if you start with compact support, that the asymptotic front speed is, uh, is two for this equation with these, this notation. And then five years later, Bremson showed that the approach to the asymptotic front speed is not exponential, but with a one over t term, one over time. So it's decaying very slowly to, um, to its asymptotic speed. Um, now, if you move to the next slide, I started thinking about these issues and was motivated by a, an idea that came from plasma physics, um, which I've called the linear spreading velocity. And let me give you a bit of a feel for it. So let's look at the top one of the two pictures. 
um, you see on the left, I've indicated that's when you linearize the equation. So imagine you've, you have your dynamical equation and you throw away all the nonlinearities. So it's as if in this Bramson equation, you throw away the u cubed uh, term. Then because uh, if we're thinking about problems where you where the linear st the, the, the state with phi in this case or u small uh, is unstable you see again i've tried to indicate that the initial condition on the left is growing out in time you see the spreading to the uh, to the right that's the dotted curve it's growing the uh, the area where phi in this case is non-zero is growing and it's also spreading to the right and left. Now I've drawn here a case where the equation is asymmetric so that the, the spreading is also by itself moving to the right. This is happening, for instance, a lot in plasma physics. So you see that already for the linear equation, you can ask what is the speed with which the right-hand side of this region, the red region, is spreading? And not only can you ask that, but you can calculate that explicitly with asymptotic methods because you've linearized the equation. It's only uh, an analysis of the, uh, basically based on the, what we physicists call the dispersion relation of the linear equation. And then now imagine you put the nonlinearities non back into it. And then there are many situations where basically the the, the linear spreading, because of course that's also that's in a sense always happening in the region where phi or u before is still small, is drawing along with it the nonlinear profile. The nonlinearities only start to set in in the region where where phi is large enough, and so I at some point realized, motivated also by some remark by, well, remarks by other physicists that there are many fronts, many cases, where in a way the linear spreading pulls along the nonlinear front. And if you're willing to accept that, then the great thing for applied physics or applied scientists is that if you're willing to accept it maybe as a conjecture, then you can at least calculate the asymptotic front speed because that was, after all, governed by the linearized equations and that we can calculate explicitly. And this is actually what the people in plasma physics had shown. Now, in this next uh, picture, I'm illustrating this with this rather complicated panel, but you see on the, on the upper side, um, I'm sure, oh, let, let's first look at the columns. On the left, I'm showing the Fisher equation. The middle one is for the swift hohenberg equation. It's again a, an equation first order in time, but fourth order in space with a finite wavelength sensibility. And I'm assuming that many people in the audience will certainly know the kuramoto shibosinski equation. Again, first order in time, fourth order in space with, with a spatial nonlinearity. Now, in the top panels, I've just used, indeed, I've thrown away all the nonlinearities and looked at the linear dynamics and plotted them in such a way that you can just in a still picture see the dynamics. As you see, indeed, in all cases, there's no saturation. There's no saturation because of the linear equation. But you see, indeed, the, the idea of a linear spreading speed is, to the eye, is immediately obvious. It's sort of the slope in these pictures. And... Uh, you see for swift hornberg and kuramoto shibosinski even though the pa there's a complicated pattern uh, once the, the thing becomes large, you can still see the, the linear spreading speed illustrated quite well. Now, in the middle row, I folded, I put the nonlinearities back into it, and then you see, indeed, nice fronts develop. But if you look at the slope, in this case, this is for these nonlinearities that just saturate, you do indeed see that the front is just being pulled along, if you wish, by the linear spreading. And you see in the, the middle row and the right one, the right one has this nice chaotic behavior that kuramoto shibosinski is so nice, uh, nicely illustrates. But you see, in, again, you can see that there is an overall, the, the region where this chaotic behavior starts to spread is still well defined. And it's the same speed as the, the governed by the linear equations. And once you realize this, you think, ah, but I can also play with the nonlinearity so that they enhance the growth. And if you do this a little bit, then you can... <clears throat> 
indeed find fronts, and you see this from the slope below, that move faster. And I've called this pushed fronts because in some sense they're being pushed faster by the nonlinear behavior uh, in the nonlinear region. Um, and so for these pushed fronts are more complicated because then all the nonlinearities play a role. But um, if you're willing to focus more on or just accept that there is a whole class of fronts that are pulled, then you can do a lot of interesting mathematics with them. And this is shown on the next page, number 10, so next slide, um, where I realized that if you're, you understand this picture, you can actually go far beyond this uh, asymptotic result by Bramson. Here I'm showing the, the rate of approach of a front speed, which is both for these featureless fronts of Fisher, but also for these pattern forming fronts, that they actually, you can calculate the asymptotic front speed completely um, included. You get also a one over t to the three halves terms with prefactors that are completely known in terms of the, the linear behavior of the equation. And so this result is exact, but non-rigorous. It was not, it's derived as a physicist with a, a number of insights, but to prove it was just another matter and I couldn't do that. But it's a very general result, independent of initial conditions, provided you have compact support or decay sufficiently fast exponentially. It's independent on at which level you track the front. I've indicated this with the dotted line in this upper picture. If you prefer to track a front at an upper, say in the nonlinear region, you still get measure this front speed. Or if you say I measure a front speed by integrating phi and getting sort of the average position, all of that gives the same expression for the asymptotic front speed. Um, and as I said before, it's also uh, in the, it's, it's relevant for a whole set of equations, including those that form patterns. Now, um, this is actually a not only a remarkable mathematical result, but very strong result for pattern forming systems. And I've just given here a few in pictures, a few systems where this applies to. It has been measured and tested in uh, fronts in the Rayleigh Binar, for instance, one at the, the, the picture at the bottom is from an experimental paper. By the way, this one over time uh, rate of approach to the asymptotic front speed is also important because it's a very slow uh, approach. And so experimentally, it's very difficult to see the asymptotic front speed. But it has also been seen in the uh, situations like the picture on the upper left, where you see a, a uh, sort of like a tube of fluid, you can think about it like that, and you have the, the Rayleigh instability and it, you, it leads to pinched off droplets. And it's quite amazing that just from the analysis that I described, you can even uh, uh, analyze or predict the number of the, the wavelength spacing of the droplets that it leaves behind, even though that's a very strongly nonlinear regime. Now, let's go to the next slide. This brings me to an issue which a colleague of mine has, has actually written papers, the unreasonable effectiveness of physics to the mathematical sciences. So he, he turned it around and said, and this is from field theory, this is my colleague uh, Robert Dijkgraaf, uh, who has been stressing that also in field theory there are a number of um, uh, results that are new to mathematics, which are, uh, at least at the time, were un are still unproven, I think, but come from physical insights and, and heuristic arguments. And likewise, what I just described, I think this ha also happened to, uh, uh, to the problem of front propagation. So the main theme that I want to make is that, yes, mathematics can do a lot for the, uh, the moonshot problem, but I hope that the mathematicians in the audience will also feel that uh, the mathematics will be enriched by this as well. And this brings me to this slide, uh, trying to stress that applied mathematics is more than just applying math. It's not like you dial up a mathematician and say, I have this equation, how can I solve this? Um, of course, that might happen sometimes, but most of the fun of studying real problems is in the model building. You're thinking about what you can throw out, what are the essential effects, where I have seen, where in which other field have I seen similar behavior, 
and what does this mean? So that's in some sense why you see this circle and why I stress that uh, um, it, the mathematics in some sense only the, the applying mathematics only comes in the at the end when you ha once you have the equation, but much of the fun is also in the model building. Now, if you think about mathematics playing the role in the Moonshot program to and, and contribute to all the other challenges, that also this picture also means that it is important to bring the mathematicians together with their colleagues uh, to discuss what is your problem, what are you working on, and how is this is this important. And here is, I'm not going to go through it, here is a list of some of the challenges that I, I realized when I read through the program. Uh, problems like deep learning are not at all understood. Uh, quantum sciences needs new quantum information sciences. And in, if you go through this list and think about it, indeed, uh, there's a lot of new mathematics needed. And indeed, bring things, bringing people together to work on this and explore what you can do to, to contribute uh, brings me to the Lorne Center. I mentioned to you that I was the first director, I uh, helped establish it, and I've been asked to tell you a little bit about the Lorne, the Lorne Center because it might also be an example for what you can do in Japan to have mathematics flourish and contribute to the Moonshot program. So we started actually very simple. As you know, I'm a physicist. I got together with a colleague in mathematics and astronomy uh, originally and thought it it would be nice to have a workshop center where we bring people together in groups of 30, 40 people um, to exchange views and, uh, and, and ongoing research. So we started in these fields but, uh, and focused mostly on real driving the, uh, the monodisciplines initially, but um, it has spread over the years to include all fields of research. Actually, nowadays, when I was director, we started a collaboration with a, uh, a center called the NIAS, which is in the social sciences and humanities. And nowadays, it's very common even to have social sciences workshops and uh, uh, at the, the Lawrence Center. When we started for some of these first uh, new collaborations, for instance, there was a, a very interesting workshop. I think it was the first in the world on this topic ever on the mathematics of the uh, of Islamic art, and it brought together even architects from who were uh, involved in designing mosques, etc. And as you know, these have a lot of patterns. And it was discovered at the workshop how much interesting mathematics is behind it. Now nowadays, the nice thing is we the Lawrence Center has both monodiscipline workshops, so focused on informatics or astronomy or physics or uh, a field in the social sciences. But naturally, because it's it has spread, it's also a wonderful place to have multidisciplinary workshops. And they come to us sort of more or less naturally. And nowadays, you see about 80 workshops a year with, in total, about 3,000 participants. And it's the participants that come with the, the topics. Um, the focus is on having ample time for discussions. Uh, it's not like a, a conference. Uh, there are talks, but typically we always stress leave time for informal meetings and discussions, even one-on-one -on -one or in groups, etc. And we often say the, uh, the, our aim is that at the end of the week, because nowadays most workshops are simply a week, we sometimes have them a bit longer, but um, the aim is that at the end of the week, all the participants know each other, and you often see that a workshop is the start of a collaboration that's then picked on um, uh, just by internet and by, by visits, etc. although some workshops come back later uh, for another time. We focus on uh, present projects, not uh, published results, but really what are you working on now? Can you share data? Can you help each other? Uh, diversity in all respects, that includes uh, seniority, young people, uh, older people, a mixture of that, national, international. And I might add that the Lawrence Center is also open completely to suggestions from international suggestions. If you would come with an IE from Japan, um, 
the law center staff would probably say, would you happen to have a colleague in the Netherlands that you could uh, propose as a co-organizer, but we'd be happy to do your topic if our board decides that it's a, a very fruitful topic. Um, and, um, and the Lawrence Center actually helps you uh, develop an idea into a successful workshop. And the idea is that the scientists should focus on the science. They say, you do the research, we do the rest. And so also the organizers is, are really involved in the research during the workshop. And so my last slide is this one, that I do think this concept uh, that we had, that we developed at the Lawrence Center could also be very fruitful to um, uh, bring mathematics to the moonshot program. This idea of uh, having small um, workshops uh, actively involved on what is the problem you're trying to solve, how can I help, uh, oh, it actually gives me, I, I could do this if you do that, um, is I think something that could easily be exported to, to Japan and to, to, to bring mathematics to center stage in the Moonshot program. And that is um, what I would like to contribute to this, uh, to this meeting here at, in Japan, in Tokyo, on the Moonshot. And I'd be happy to take uh, questions both on the Lawrence Center on the, or on the science. Thank you very much, Professor Salus. So we'd like to have time for questions. Anyone who has an opinion, please raise your hand. This is Motoko Tani. Uh, so I'm pretty nice to meet you. impressed uh, of, uh, in your activity, collaboration with uh, uh, humanity and social science. Mm -hmm. And so always it's very difficult, uh, this collaboration between science and the humanity social science. Yeah. And how it works. Uh, so who bring up the topics and uh, how you uh, deepen these topics? Okay, so that's a very good issue because indeed the gap in, in language and in, in sometimes even in ways of working is quite, uh, sometimes quite large. The topics are always suggested by the scientist. Um, it's not that, so we have boards, there's a board that actually uh, does the selection of the, the, the topics. Um, three times a year, scientists can send in a proposal for a workshop. And I would say if the model that the Lawrence Center has used is like the spreading of a, a drop of oil. Um, it's, um, it has spread and, and the social sciences have slowly embraced this model by um, being invited to a workshop and then saying, hey, this, this model works very well. Now, I'm not, uh, maybe I've, I've uh, yes, the topics are being suggested bottom up, but uh, often if you enter a new field, what I did as a, as a director at the time is that I sometimes called um, colleagues or approached colleagues, I asked the board, could you suggest a few people that I could maybe call that have interesting topics. So it's not that um, we say you should do this or, uh, or that, but um, that we approach colleagues that and said, look, we think that in your field might actually uh, benefit from uh, organizing a workshop in the Lawrence Center. And because you're, uh, we think that there is, for instance, a connection to another field uh, that could contribute. And, and then indeed the stage, it's on one of my slides, I say that the Lawrence Center is, is often quite helpful in um, reaching out to, to or finding, the, and that there the, the boards do play a role. So you can even um, ask the Lawrence Center for help in suggesting colleagues or fields that could, could help you with, uh, with, your, with setting up the program. Does this help? Yes, thank you very much. And also I noticed that uh, you have not only advisory board, but also scientific uh, coordinator. It's a young people who 
the connection yes. and uh, deep in the topics, uh, how it comes? Yes. Uh, yes, these are people that have a PhD in science them, themselves, <laughs> and um, part of their role is that they say some of the organizers are still too much in the mode of trying to organize a conference. And so part of their role is to say, look, our experience is that you should leave um, time for real discussions. But they also think with you, I mean, they try to, they, it's a sort of a, a discussion they have like, okay, so what is the main aim you would like to get from your workshop? Ah, okay, so given that you would like to do this, maybe it's a good idea that you have a senior person to uh, give like an over an introduction to the field in the first day and that you then have brainstorm sessions. So the, these people, they um, well, two, two of them, they, they have a lot of experience on how these things work and, and various types of models that you can use because sometimes a workshop splits up into separate groups. Sometimes they, it's more on, they leave it to one-on-one -on -one type collaborations. Um, and so they help to, to think with you. Thank you very much. It looks like we run out of time. We will move on to the discussion session. Thank you very much again, Professor Salus. Sure. Okay, thanks. Uh, so uh, let us uh, start the panel discussion. Um, this is the mathematical science and cross-sectional technology to pursue all uh, moonshot goals. Uh, so. If you attend the yesterday meeting, you have heard many, many times uh, what is moonshot go, but uh, uh, there are people who are only here, so I just briefly explain what is moonshot go. And so moonshot go is a program to shoot moon. And so what is moon? Uh, the moon is, uh, in my understanding, the future, uh, our future and the future for the next generation. In the fifth uh, uh, basic plan for science and technology proposed a concept, uh, Society 5.0, it's a human-centric society, and we recognize the we are entering the, the new era, uh, digitalized uh, uh, society, and uh, but uh, it was just a conceptual proposal and how we implement this notion and to create and form a future uh, sustainable uh, uh, development and the human-centric society. So that is the the, the, the moonshot goal, uh, I would like to say. Uh, so there are three mission areas. Uh, uh, so first one is aging society. The second one is global environment. The third one is exploring new frontiers. And these three, uh, this uh, area uh, breaking down, breaking into six working group which uh, we meet and uh, discuss in this international symposium. Uh, working group one is about uh, expanding human potential. Working group two is uh, uh, realizing human life as a uh, nerve, uh, nervous system related to tissues. And working group three is the AI and robots, robot and robotics. And the working group four is global environment working group is the uh, food, uh, uh, future agriculture, and working group six, uh, the quantum and related phenomena. And so in this working group uh, seven, the, uh, we would like to discuss how we can contribute to achieve the moonshot goal. And uh, there are three items which we can discuss. So first of all, what are the useful mathematical ideas and the method in the era of digital revolution? That's why uh, mathematics uh, is put as a cross-sectional issue. And the second one is, uh, of course, this is the main topic, so what is a cross-sectional technology or mathematics uh, for a moonshot course. These two items cannot be separated, so we would like to discuss uh, that together. And the third one is how we establish a platform to develop mathematical methods for solution of social societal problems to make efficient interactions. 
And so even though we identify what mathematical technology is useful in the uh, moonshot goal, but uh, if we don't have any platform uh, to interact uh, MS goals, uh, the, uh, the domain uh, scientists, uh, it doesn't work. And how, how we can set such kind of opportunity and uh, discuss and deepen the idea and uh, that is most important. So I would like to spend much more time about these uh, third items. Uh, so the speaker today, uh, you already heard the several talks and the, uh, I don't repeat uh, to introduce uh, those four speakers, Emmanuel Scandis and uh, Esmasa Nishiura, Christian Lach and William San Saros. And uh, uh, Candice and uh, Saros are uh, gone because they are remote uh, participation. But uh, uh, as a panelist, I have two members, uh, Hiroshi Suito from Tokyo University and uh, Masato Wakayama from uh, Kyushu University. So they are going to uh, present shortly um, what uh, their mission and why they are here. Uh, thank you for introduction. My name is Hiroshi Suito from Tohoku University, Advanced Institute for Materials Research. Uh, so I'd like to show you some activities of uh, our institute related to the collaboration between mathematical science and the material science. The unique uh, characteristic of our institute has that is, uh, it has a mathematical science division in material science institute. So during the history of this uh, institute, ma mas mathematics developed uh, many collaborations based, uh, with uh, mathematical science based on several mathematical concepts, such as uh, uh, topology, uh, discrete geometrical uh, analysis, uh, graph theory, or persistent homology. So uh, the tight-knit collaboration between mathematics and the material science play an important role during all the each stages of the material science from uh, uh, measurement to the fabrication. So there is another institute ne uh, located next door to our institute, which is the, the name of which is the Tohoku Forum for Creativity. And it uh, provides some long programs, uh, widely ranging from uh, spintronics to social sciences. So I think this, is this in forum also have an important role to make a collaboration between mathematics and other sciences. And also I'd like to mention about the incorporation of young scientists to the mathematics-based industrial programs. This is, the name is the GLIP Sentai program. Uh, Professor Latch already pro uh, mentioned about the LIPS program in Los Angeles, and this is a Japanese version, uh, and a strong support from IBAM, thank you so much. <laughs> and, uh, in this program, one team consists of two U.S. and two Japanese students spend eight weeks during the summer and tackle the program uh, project given by industries. So students came mainly from mathematics and statistics, but participants also hailed from other sciences and engineering fields. And thanks to our great uh, sponsors, in 2018, Toyota and NEC uh, participated to this program and provided these kind of projects. And this year, Toyota gave uh, two projects, and Fujitsu uh, newly uh, participated. Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, so next, uh, Professor uh, Wakayama, please. Thank you very much. Uh, my slide is uh, rather simple uh, than the, all of the speaker uh, you have today, I think. And uh, so, Following the request uh, by Dr. <laughs> Professor Kotani, uh, uh, you can see the agenda of uh, the, my talk, uh, short self-introduction, and IMI. IMI means uh, uh, Institute of Mathematics for Industry uh, in Kyushu University, and uh, around uh, about uh, uh, education or fostering the younger people, uh, math PhD in Kyushu University, and some example uh, joint work uh, with uh, industry. So I'm very happy if I can uh, contribute uh, 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 
even bit uh, uh, to 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 uh, create the platform of this uh, uh, so uh, moonshot program. Yes. Yes. Uh, this is short my uh, introduction, and uh, I uh, my research field is uh, 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 representation theory and number theory. Uh, representation theory is a group theory, and uh, it's uh, mm, organized the symmetry. Uh, sometimes uh, infinite dimensional symmetry. So that's, uh, it's, uh, I have, uh, when I was young, I read the paper by Ojin uh, Wigner. Yeah, he, he made uh, such papers. And uh, these, uh, those, uh, uh, the uh, uh, field is uh, strongly related to the physics and also the number theory. So the keyword I can give you are the zeta function, modular form, and Galois group, and so on. And uh, why? So I'm a so-called uh, pure mathematician. However, uh, as you, uh, you can see in the blue uh, uh, letter, so uh, this is uh, essentially the, the uh, time when I will go into the application of mathematics to the uh, industrial work and the other uh, disciplines. And then, so after that, uh, with my colleague, I founded the Institute of Mathematics for Industry. And uh, you can see uh, this kind of things. Uh, it is my short presentation. Uh, and uh, so at that time, uh, the, the when we start the global COE program, the name is uh, the education hub of education and the research hub of mathematics for industry. Now what is mathematics for industry? That we aim is uh, the third line. Uh, mathematics for industry we define is a new research area that serves to create advanced technology in respect to response to industrial needs by innovating flexible and uh, uh, versatile uh, methods in mathematics, statics, and computing. Feedback to uh, mathematics from these activity is highly expected, but at that time, no mention on artificial intelligence when it was uh, 2008. And why we established the uh, IMI is uh, there are three uh, main points. Uh, there must be a lot of new interesting mathematical problems in industry or society. In, a, in <coughs> other words, if we are only focusing our research currently recognized as pure mathematics or the existing mathematics, mathematics will be shrinking in the future. And also, uh, in order to explore the new career path for the PhD in mathematics in Japan, and also the uh, uh, to foster the PhD in mathematics with broad interest and view for applications. And third was, uh, we should uh, contribute the society using mathematics developed in the 20th century and so on. Uh, most of the mathematics achievement in 20th, 20th century has not been used in engineering, life science, et cetera. The key word is abstraction. Uh, let me, uh, I would like to uh, uh, skip this slide, but uh, I would like to mention two things. Mass could sound mass in Japanese. So, so mass is, uh, it indicates uh, big data. So I think uh, that this institute treat also the big data. And uh, so this is important. First director is uh, I, I myself, but the second one is uh, uh, Fukumoto. His uh, expertise is full, di uh, full mechanics dynamics and the third one, current one, Professor Sayaki, his measure is topology and singularity theory. However, member, half of a member also uh, uh, engage uh, currently the, the joint work is industry. So every, eight, every year, uh, almost 30 uh, joint work industry uh, uh, has been uh, performed. Activity in the IMI with uh, industry. Uh, one first one is an efficient algorithm for large-scale nursery school matching program. The goal is a good assignment of children to nursery schools. And difficulties, of course, uh, uh, large size and uh, complex constraints, especially the brothers and so on. And then extended form of game theory and uh, efficient uh, search uh, algorithm. Uh, optimizing theory makes it possible to, to give her the answer. And this is the uh, importance of, uh, of the, the, uh, the, so mathematics joined uh, local data uh, things and global uh, things. So for instance, the first one is a deep, uh, uh, 
uh, neural network things, and uh, but it is uh, short-sighted. Also, uh, as you could uh, heard uh, from uh, the talk uh, by uh, Professor Nishibura, uh, passive homology makes it to be the get the, getting the, the information from the, the uh, global sense. Um, mathematics uh, maxima maximize the efficiency efficacy of the small data, and the, the uh, the, this one is uh, just uh, the uh, uh, brazing uh, joints. Wax helps uh, join bond the two materials. So in this uh, in this case, uh, we use, uh, uh, for instance, uh, uh, a geometric optimization theory and uh, to see the uh, flow of the uh, uh, curvature flow, and it makes uh, this kind of the very pre uh, precise uh, uh, techniques. Last one is uh, this is also the the. Uh, the computer uh, graphics, and you can see the, some distribution of the language and regularization Lee theory in the neural network, matroid graph theory, machine learning, and Gleipner basis, and so on. So this shows the experience of the mathematics uh, can help uh, the, the new world. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, oh, thank you very much. Yeah, so uh, just uh, as uh, Professor Wakayama mentioned, the uh, so mathematics has been served uh, with science and technology by providing common language. And in 17th century, uh, Galileo Galilei wrote the, this grand book of the universe is written in the language of mathematics. Since then, mathematics uh, play a role to make a problem uh, in real world into mathematics uh, to have a hypothesis uh, to work on. And in 20th century, a new paradigm emerged. It's a computational science. And uh, due to this computational science, uh, we can uh, tackle more complex phenomena to the, re of the real world uh, by using a simulation and high performance computing. But now we are in the, the digital revolution era. And so, uh, Mathematics has a new role in this uh, revolutional age. And the first of all, the, um, the effective interaction between the real world and the digital world is a core concept to real society 5.0. And uh, to make the, this bridge, mathematics, mathematical model will be very helpful to transform this real world problem into digital world. And uh, the more important role is uh, mathematics as, uh, to formulate social issues into mathematical challenge so that uh, multidisciplinary uh, researchers can uh, gather and uh, discuss and tackle those problems. And so the, we uh, already show several examples of how uh, mathematics is important. Uh, but the, uh, on the other hand, it's very difficult to make a, a efficient uh, interaction between the, the scientists in domain and the mathematician. Uh, so it cannot be uh, separated well, but uh, we need a platform to discuss, to develop mathematical method to, for a solution of a societal problem to make efficient interaction. And so um, the Professor Raj uh, showed uh, his uh, um, uh, trial and the successful model to do so. And uh, he is in the IPAM. And uh, he also mentioned there are six such kind of institutes in the US. And the, this mathematical institute is not uh, accommodate mathematician, but uh, this uh, mathematical institute uh, uh, is host uh, host long-term uh, program, thematic program, a uh, series of workshop to uh, incubate idea to transform societal problem into mathematical concept. And the, uh, you already hear what kind of uh, theme they are discussing. It's, it's not just a mathematical mode, uh, problem, but uh, societal issue like uh, uh, red blood cells, or uh, uh, the theoretical understanding of machine learning, or optimization system of uh, rare high impact random event, and uh, self-driving cars, and big data in numbers. 
And also uh, Wings, uh, Professor Saros uh, explained about uh, his the trial uh, for the interaction of mathematics and humanity and social science. And the, uh, they discuss about the peace and conflict, uh, uh, qualitative, quantitative evidence using social simulation and uh, like uh, the fakery, mathematical, cryptographic, social, and legal approach. These are the uh, very imp uh, uh, useful uh, model uh, the we can learn from that. So these are the model, and but uh, uh, I would like to discuss what we can do to make such kind of platform for the moonshot goal, so that people can gather and discuss. And uh, uh, Professor Wakayama said, uh, what kind of mathematical method is useful is unpredictable. So when the Moonshot uh, uh, research has uh, been developing new uh, program, a new challenge are uh, emerging, and uh, probably they need some help from mathematician. And so, how we can uh, uh, the host uh, the accommodate this uh, uh, problem which will emerge uh, at the moment we cannot predict. So that is what we would like to discuss. So. So maybe, uh, Professor Latch, you already talked a little bit about your uh, activity, but uh, from your experiments, uh, what was very useful and uh, for this uh, kind of interaction and platform? Okay, so I talked earlier already about uh, what we do at IPAM, and um, well, I, I could say many things, but maybe one thing to get it started, I do think... Um, providing a platform where you bring people together for a longer period of time is very important because I think if you just meet people at regular conferences or so, that's, you know, you can talk a little bit, but really not that much. I think to really get to know people from other communities and build some long lasting uh, interactions, I think having some sort of a uh, mechanism or platform where you have um, uh, deeper interactions is very important. So I, I mentioned that we have one week workshops and long programs and there's a clear difference that in the long programs, there are, it's much more successful building new interactions between people who haven't really met before. So if you really want to introduce mathematics in, um, in uh, other disciplines, I think one needs more than just, uh, just a day or a few days or so, and also needs to think about mechanisms to really promote um, interactions beyond just listening to talks. So maybe that's one comment I want to make here. I also realize that when I attend the usual workshop, uh, I listen to talks and uh, I got some interest and uh, we some have some discussion, short discussion. We can do together this kind of things. But uh, when I come back home, I have no time to pass through and just forget. This kind of uh, opportunity we are missing. And so long-term program will be very useful you go together, you come together, meet every day, and continue discussion, discussion. Uh, that will be very useful to tackle yep. this uh, program with a multidisciplinary way. That is, I, I realize. Um, Professor Nishiura, you would like to add some comments? Uh, yes. Uh, so you may wonder why, <coughs> why such a platform is necessary. Uh, including a wide variety of mathematicians. Uh, I think one maybe partial answer to that kind of question is that, uh, uh, say, uh, maybe we can say it's a prio adaptations. So what does it mean by prio adaptations? So prio means that uh, before questions are real serious, uh, difficulty arise, we have to, in a sense, prepare the uh, mm, kind of oppositions to solve the, uh, these issues. Because if the real problem pops up and then, oh, we have to uh, learn, we have to gather this kind of, or that kind of people, that it's too late. So we have to prepare a sort of uh, uh, many talents in advance. And so that's and then if you can do that, 
it's a pre-adaptation. So we have many, many talents and many, many methodologies. Maybe a classical one is a very modern one. It doesn't matter. But uh, uh, we have uh, some sort of uh, accumulation of the uh, wisdom uh, during the discussions. Uh, <coughs> of course, some of the themes uh, so far in this uh, Lowland Center, uh, uh, IPAM, is uh, they are trying to attack, solve the, uh, the real problem. There's some problems are really more deeply uh, rooted uh, mathematically or physically. So, but, but nobody knows. Nobody knows uh, after 10 years later, this kind of methodology might uh, be, become more useful. And uh, if you don't uh, prepare such, uh, or accumulation of wisdom, I would say, that's the prior adaptations because in, in your DNA, more than, I don't know how many percentage I forgot, but the more than 90% of your DNA, you don't know what's the function of DNA. But the, once the environment change, we, has, we somehow adapt. So mathematics, of course, this is not the one function, but the mathematics is a kind of, uh, we always doing a prior adaptation for all scientific activities. And that's uh, also the power, power and also universality uh, of the mathematics. Uh, so, uh, Suito Sensei, you are organizing G Lips, and the, you gather a student and uh, give the industrial program. And uh, when they start, they don't, probably they don't know anything about industrial program, how they, what they learn are uh, useful. And so, how you function these, uh, uh, the uh, G Lips program after two months, uh, they reach some kind of solution. Uh, it's a difficult question, but uh, in the beginning, the, our sponsors uh, give our, us uh, topics and problems, and then the very wide variety, uh, the students coming from a very wide variety, for example, not only the mathematics, but also from sometimes engineering and sometimes from architect architecture, <laughs> then they uh, collaborate. So they are very young, so very adaptive to the new ideas. So they, then they uh, notice that our oh, mathematics can be used <laughs> to many kinds of problems. So it's, I, I feel that the power of the younger generations, and they are very happy to know that uh, the, they can collaborate with a very diverse uh, uh, area, diverse, diverse region of the scientific fields. So not uh, the eight, uh, G RIPS program continues eight weeks, but we don't need so much um, directions. They adapt by themselves. And finally, uh, of course, there's some discussions with us and with the sponsors, but the finally, they can uh, come to the very good uh, results and uh, conclusions. So I think it's uh, based on the mathematics, but uh, go to the self-organizing uh, uh, scientific uh, uh, considerations, I think. So already are the everybody uh, in the gate uh, uh, implicitly and uh, explicitly, and I think that uh, so the need of the platform is as follows. I think the mathematics and the mathematics has a mathematician has a nature, uh, uh, which uh, so if we so for the application. So if we put uh, the mathematician in some uh, 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 some number of the, the uh, yes, sorry, uh, uh, topics, some topics. So it's against the nature of the mathematics and the math uh, mathematician nature. So because uh, mathematics and math are, once you uh, can sol solve uh, the problems in some specific field, then it is sometimes applicable for the other things. And the mathematician has a nature to explore these kind of things. So that uh, the one-to-one -one correspondence is not so good. So it, uh, I think, are uh, one of the reasons why we should uh, uh, allow it, uh, some platform in uh, cross-sectional uh, field. So in my experiments, I'm a geometer, so I can answer to all the questions related to geometry, which is 
I'm not uh, true, but uh, I could say that uh, geometry is uh, my expertise, but uh, when we solve a problem in material science, geometry is not the, the enough, and uh, we need uh, many other mathematicians. So we need a team, but on the other hand, the, uh, my geometrical idea to material science can be transformed into a problem to life science. So it's much more efficient to have a, a cross-sectional team uh, to work with many domains. Uh, so that is the idea. So um, I would like to ask uh, Imura-san, be here sitting in front. Uh, he's from NEC, and also he is a sponsor of uh, uh, some research center in University of Tokyo on mathematical science, and also he's a sponsor of GLEP. So what is your expectation to mathematics? You know, one of the good thing of mathematicians is, as uh, Wakayama Sensei mentioned, that the they can s somewhat be met metalize or the things. So this is one of the important thing. But the I have some question for you. Uh, if you try to solve the social issues and the about the stakeholder, sometimes we need to know the citizens' issues or something. How can you implement in, in that kind of platforms? And the another thing is on a kind of venue. You are doing in university, but the sometimes issue itself in the real world. And the sometimes even the engineer made a mistake to really understand the issue mean that the team should go into the real place to really understand the issue. How do you implement those things in that platform? Seems a challenge. <coughs> Could you comment on that? I completely agree with you. The, the why AI more was work well is uh, well, the, um, in the MMR, the mathematics and uh, experimental material science uh, live together, meet every day, and uh, we can really uh, watch, uh, look at the uh, raw data. So when they bring some uh, uh, um, data which already they uh, screened, uh, we can, it not inspire mathematics and uh, looking at uh, the uh, phenomena uh, inspire mathematician and get some new idea which are very different from material scientists. So um, going into the scene is very important, but uh, it's also a challenge, and so we should uh, consider that thing. So, but uh, this kind of real, uh, real interaction, the looking at the phenomena is very, very important. That's my thing. Thank you very much. We would like to consider. Is there any opinion, comment, suggestion from the floor? Uh, so if not, then the, uh, in 10 minutes, uh, in 20 minutes, uh, uh, I have to wrap up the uh, working group seven. And the, so this is the base of a discussion. So the <coughs> I wanted to suggest uh, three things, but uh, it, it was made before the discussion, and so I can change uh, with your suggestion. So the one suggestion is uh, we need a cross-sectional team. That is the first suggestion. And second suggestion is we need a platform, so arrange a platform to gather research from around the world to discuss and identify the action. So the third one is uh, international collaboration and uh, participation is uh, very important. And also fostering young people is again very important. These three items I would like to recommend, but uh, this is just my own idea before the discussion. So please make comment. I would like to, this is my mission to wrap up what we discussed today. So. I'm coming here to, you know, for my job, but the, I want. Uh, uh, 
My name is Shigeyuki Otaka from OIST. I'm coming here to you know, get uh, information about this project, but as an ordinary people, I feel there's some uh, mis I, I don't say I don't say misreading, but some ordinary people feel that technology or science can solve everything. But we, I think this is not impossible, I think. So from the viewpoint of this project, I can't imagine the future society. What will happen in the result of this uh, output will produce what kind of society? That is, uh, I'm not so clear about that. And I feel that the, this project needs to have more pure science because pure science is not money oriented. We, you, I think the mathematics is a kind of pure science and you can cal calculate or rec recommend and you can say something about the limitation of the technology and science. Without that kind of viewpoint, this project will mislead to the ordinary people to the something different <laughs> area. This is my concern about this project. So, so thank you very much. Is there any comment to his uh, comment? Uh, so the moonshot uh, program itself is uh, to realize the human-centric society. And uh, as I explained many times, uh, it's the uh, profile, all the profile. It's not only one moonshot goal will make a society. Uh, so there are several issues which we would like to solve. And of course, it's, 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 it's not uh, possible only by science and technology innovation, but at least we can do something. That is the idea. And, but also to make a human-centric society, to make people happy, to make a future, we need uh, some kind of uh, uh, input from LC. That's why we discuss LC in the morning. And uh, then, as you said, the uh, mathematical contribution, one of the mathematical contributions sh to show the limit and, uh, uh, in this framework. And the, uh, but the uh, limit, uh, recognition of a limit is uh, to uh, show the next step, the, because uh, this is a, a boundary condition, it's a limit. Uh, it's, it's impossible to make it clear we can change the boundary conditions so that we can move forward. That is uh, one of our missions. So thank you very much. Can I go back to this? And uh, combining to the platform and the fostering young people. And the within this platform, people may understand the real issue or system things. And the, we need to foster those kind of people to designing the next thing. And the, uh, the lack of this uh, talent is uh, quite a challenge for Japan. So maybe you should think those kind of things. Yeah, uh, I, yeah I think, uh, thank you very much for a very useful comment. Uh, that is one of the trial by Suito Sanders and so uh, he uh, invites uh, uh, grad uh, undergraduate uh, graduate student to tackle the social problem by using mathematics. And uh, on this uh, project, uh, they are doing project, uh, they learn things, a uh, project uh, based learning, and uh, they, they, uh, they are very different uh, people with a uh, different mindset. And uh, through this uh, platform and uh, through Moonshot Go, if mathematics can contribute uh, to discuss and the uh, inviting young pe people uh, participation young people are very important uh, uh, so these uh, at least uh, young people we will uh, foster uh, peop uh, people from next generation too. that is probably the most important uh, uh, goals may I one thing uh, okay. Uh, <coughs> Okay, most of the missions, uh, moonshot missions, are big challenge. So uh, maybe not possible within, say, 10 years. So I think at uh, this kind of platform, we can not just not directly solve the uh, urgent issue, but uh, 
set up or ask uh, good questions for the future. In the mathematicians, it's a more kind of a, a little bit good distance from other disciplines or also uh, 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 training well and uh, logically and uh, mathematics is always most important thing is the uh, find a good uh, uh, question and find a good definition. So in that sense, I think not just solving the problem, but also ask a good question. And this platform works for that purpose also. Yeah, so yesterday, uh, somebody said the definition is very important for a moonshot core. So Masamashan really like uh, defined things. And so that is would be one of the contribution. Uh, so there must be more comment and suggestion, but uh, our time is up. And so thank you very much for your participation for the afternoon. Thank you very much.